Healthcare is being overrun by the digital revolution. Artificial intelligence and personal health monitoring are transforming the way illnesses are diagnosed. Finland is at the forefront of this revolution, rethinking healthcare and pushing innovations. But why Finland? How did a small country like us become a global leader in digital health? Well, it's literally in our genes. Not only are we creative and full of ideas, but we have a unique and isolated gene pool. 100% of our patient records are in electronic format, and soon, half a million Finns will have their genomes analyzed. And we are open. International researchers have access to our world-class health data, including lifelong patient records, imaging data, and full traceability. Test beds allow health tech companies to develop services in an authentic hospital environment, and all this with a high level of security. Finland is also home to groundbreaking startups. Osgenic creates virtual environments where surgeons can prepare for operations safely. Their aim is to prevent costly errors in surgery. Another pioneering startup, Nigen, provides a risk assessment for chronic diseases. The test combines genome-wide analysis with lifestyle risk factors. Finland is an ideal place for research and innovation for many leading international companies. GE Healthcare develops wearable technology in Finland, and Bayer combines its long experience in life science with the cutting-edge know-how of the local tech startups. So why Finland? We enjoy the world's best ecosystem for health research and development. We have world-class professionals and technology companies, access to health data, plus a legislation that supports the secondary use of the data in research and innovation. We believe in world-changing ideas and turning them into global success stories. Finland works for us. Now let it work for you. Business Finland. World Ideas. Hello? Climate change is real. It's a fact and there's no time to waste. We all need to act now to create a more sustainable future. I know I don't always do the right thing and that my way of thinking is not the only way. But one thing is for sure, and that is if we want to change the future to a more sustainable one, we have to do it together. For us, collaboration has been the key to creating sustainable solutions in many different areas, like here, in energy. Look, private and public sectors are working together on our journey, and that's crucial. But for instance, we see a lot of good things happening in the transport industry. Innovations and new solutions that have a huge impact. We have seen how collaboration can achieve so much. It breaks down hierarchies and barriers and it creates opportunities for creativity and innovation. And, and that's what's needed for a more sustainable future. So, let's collaborate. In every way we can in society, in business, and between individuals, between countries and cross borders.
when Neste started on, on this renewable journey, we were probably a bit too early in commercial terms. But now it's, it's really apparent that this is the way society is going. And Neste is in the business of fighting cl climate change. Last year we partnered with the city of Oakland to create a circular economy where we would be working with partners to collect used cooking oils from the city area, converting them into renewable diesel and then bringing it back to the city for their municipal uh, vehicles to run on. So actually their municipal vehicles are running on their own fries. We have made a public promise that by 2030 we want to get to 20 million tons of CO2 reduction. How do we empower every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more? It starts with one. One employee. One developer. One organization. From one employee to a team collaborating with another team. From one organization to their customers to their customers' customers. Helping local communities, creating jobs increasing productivity for the global economy our society our world that's the impact that's the impact that's the impact each of us can have that's our opportunity a hundred thousand plus employees 75 million organizations seven billion people on the planet 100 to 75 to 7 to make every small business more productive to make every large business more competitive to make nonprofits more effective. To make government institutions more responsive. To expand access to education. To improve healthcare outcomes. And to amplify human ingenuity. When we empower every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more, we empower the world.
Healthcare is being overrun by the digital revolution. Artificial intelligence and personal health monitoring are transforming the way illnesses are diagnosed. Finland is at the forefront of this revolution, rethinking healthcare and pushing innovations. But why Finland? How did a small country like us become a global leader in digital health? Well, it's literally in our genes. Not only are we creative and full of ideas, but we have a unique and isolated gene pool. 100% of our patient records are in electronic format, and soon, half a million Finns will have their genomes analyzed. And we are open. International researchers have access to our world-class health data, including lifelong patient records, imaging data, and full traceability. Test beds allow health tech companies to develop services in an authentic hospital environment. And all this with a high level of security. Finland is also home to groundbreaking startups. Osgenic creates virtual environments where surgeons can prepare for operations safely. Their aim is to prevent costly errors in surgery. Another pioneering startup, Nigen, provides a risk assessment for chronic diseases. The test combines genome-wide analysis with lifestyle risk factors. Finland is an ideal place for research and innovation for many leading international companies. GE Healthcare develops wearable technology in Finland, and Bayer combines its long experience in life science with the cutting-edge know-how of the local tech startups. So why Finland? We enjoy the world's best ecosystem for health research and development. We have world-class professionals and technology companies, access to health data, plus a legislation that supports the secondary use of the data in research and innovation. We believe in world-changing ideas and turning them into global success stories. Finland works for us. Now let it work for you. Business Finland. World Ideas. Testing has been one of the keys to taming the COVID-19 pandemic. It can tell you whether you are infected and may need treatment, or whether you are healthy and can help other people and go to work. However, most people still do not know whether they are infected, have already had COVID-19, or can work and visit their loved ones. A new Danish national test center will help to answer these questions and thus help people get back to more normal daily lives while waiting for a vaccine or cure for COVID-19 to be developed. 
It's a component of the de-escalation strategy of Denmark to uh, ramp up our testing capacity. And there's been a uh, ramping up of the test capacity in the, in the regions. But then, as an add-on, uh, we have established uh, this track uh, where we can do diagnostics both for the virus and also uh, to examine for antibodies. So in this way, it's, it's an add-on uh, to the existing uh, healthcare services and diagnostic services in order to be sure that everybody uh, who wants to be tested for whatever reason has an access to doing so. From now on, Denmark will have two testing systems. The system under the health services will test healthcare workers and people who are ill. The system for society in general under Test Center Denmark will test people who do not have symptoms. There's been this issue uh, with a lack of supplies, testing kits, uh, uh, plastic wear and so on. Uh, and we have decided to use different uh, supply chains uh, with different equipment uh, and different reagents and so on. So in that sense, we will not compete with the same suppliers. Uh, and I think that's really important because we can foresee that there will be uh, uh, challenges with the supply uh, many months ahead. A key partner in developing the new tests is Nova Nordisk AS which has made its skills and expertise available to develop and run these types of tests on a large scale. One of the things we've done is we have made a test that is now becoming solely dependent upon reagents that Novo Nordisk itself can actually uh, either develop or, or access in a way that will not compete against others. Moreover, we've been able to scale up this PCR testing for the coronavirus in, in such a way that it's available in thousands and thousands on a daily basis. And that is something that also is with a, a precision and robustness that I think is, is beneficial. Together with other partners, Ries Hospitalet in Copenhagen and Nova Nordisk are closely collaborating on both the virus test and the even greater challenge of developing a sufficiently reliable antibody test to determine whether people have had COVID-19. We have accessed, you can say, the very relevant plasmid, we call it, that codes for the specific protein, the protein we know the viruses uses to get into the human body. It's at the same time the protein that the human immune system reacts with antibodies against. So, so by expressing that, being able to take that protein, put it onto the plates and then test all the various blood samples uh, are the antibodies against this protein. That, that will be a whole new assay that, that we develop and will make available to our colleagues. This new and more accurate antibody test will soon be ready for large-scale use by Test Center Denmark at State and Serum Institute in Copenhagen. But a key part of the project, implemented in Denmark's regions, is building a system that ensures that tests are conducted throughout Denmark and then transported to State and Serum Institute for analysis. It has involved probably 15 different governmental uh, and regional authorities, uh, including the Prime Minister's office, uh, the Ministry of Health, several directorates below the Ministry of Health, the police force, uh, the national defense, and then uh, not least important also Novo Nordisk AS, the pharmaceutical company, as well as the Novo Nordisk Foundation. All of this is under the leadership of the disease control uh, that in Denmark is called SSI, uh, that oversees and manages and owns the whole initiative. The new test center will become a fantastic research resource for combating COVID-19 and will answer key questions on whether natural antibodies provide immunity or whether there is a risk of reinfection, and whether specific types of tissue and blood increase people's risk of transmission and severe symptoms. The capacity we have will be used in epidemiological uh, in investigations. It will be used as a part of uh, contact tracing to test people who have been in contact uh, with people who have the disease. And it can also be used to test people who work with vulnerable people. That could be people at nursing homes. In particular, if there is a, like a situation with an outbreak in a nursing home, it's important to be able to test the staff. According to Cor Mulbach, many people want to be tested sometimes for rational reasons because they've been in contact with other people with COVID-19. In other cases, the psychological benefit of knowing for certain that you are healthy 
can be even more important. We actually believe that we can contribute to Denmark uh, opening up in, in a safe way so that people don't suffer too much, but at the same time we're able to get back to work and, and live a relatively more normal life. As a company, Novo Nordisk sees our responsibility towards society being very important here. We, we have some core capabilities uh, in so far as development of tests, making them in a high throughput scale, and that is critically important in this crisis situation. Both because of the health of the public, we need to make sure that as few as possible get ill and even die from the disease. Nova Science has also contributed critical testing equipment in the form of robots as a significant resource to realize this new tool to combat COVID-19. Through this unique collaboration between public and private actors, the new test center Denmark has been built and prepared for operation in less than one month. The Novo Nordisk Foundation is contributing up to 250 million Danish kroner towards the cost of obtaining the necessary testing machines, reagents and equipment to carry out up to 3 million tests. This is a natural part of the Novo Nordisk Foundation's mission, uh, which is focused on securing better lives through better health. We want to be part of saving lives uh, through early diagnostics and uh, securing the right treatment of people who might have COVID-19. It's also a matter of reopening uh, Denmark and the Danish uh, society. Uh, and that, of course, is a combination of both uh, identifying uh, people who believe they have potential exposure and individuals who may have had the disease and hence are potentially immune to it. And then thirdly, uh, it's a matter of uh, establishing a national capacity to deal with these kinds of pandemics also uh, in the future. My name is Markus Sontheimer, I'm on the board of DB Schenker. I'm the CIO and CDO responsible for technology and innovations in the logistic market. As a global service provider and the number one in Europe for land transport, we are always focusing on reducing CO2 to be a sustainable service provider. We care about safety of our drivers and our employees and we are striving jointly with partners to make land transport work in a sustainable way in our future. We launched a project in Jönköping in Sweden together with our partners Ericsson, Enride and Telia. The key idea is here to run a full autonomous truck which can be remotely steered. It is a world premiere because it's the first electric truck there is no space for a driver. If you replace the driver, you need to make sure you have a highly connected truck because you still need to be able to steer remotely. It needs to be fast, reliable, to make sure all pieces of the autonomous ecosystem are working. So 5G is for us a key technology to make that possible. Our people in Yuan Shopping have been totally happy to learn about the possibilities of their technology and how it can help as well to make a safer workspace for them in the future. Because safety, sustainability is key to the future of Schenker and it's key for trucking. That's why the connected truck based on a 5G network is an absolutely enabler for us for the future in trucking around the world. Hello? 
climate change is real. It's a fact, and there's no time to waste. We all need to act now to create a more sustainable future. I know I don't always do the right thing and that my way of thinking is not the only way. But one thing is for sure, and that is, if we want to change the future to a more sustainable one, we have to do it together. For us, collaboration has been the key to creating sustainable solutions in many different areas, like here, in energy. Look, private and public sectors are working together on our journey, and that's crucial. But for instance, we see a lot of good things happening in the transport industry innovations and new solutions that have a huge impact. We have seen how collaboration can achieve so much. It breaks down hierarchies and barriers and it creates opportunities for creativity and innovation. And, and that's what's needed for a more sustainable future. So let's collaborate. In every way we can, in society, in business, and between individuals, between countries and cross borders. We make the fuels that are part of the solution to tackling uh, climate change. When Neste started on, the, on this renewable journey, we were probably a bit too early in commercial terms. But now it's, it's really apparent that this is the way society is going. And Neste is in the business of fighting cl climate change. Last year we partnered with the city of Oakland to create a circular economy where we would be working with partners to collect used cooking oils from the city area, converting them into renewable diesel and then bringing it back to the city for their municipal uh, vehicles to run on. So actually their municipal vehicles are running on their own fries. We have made a public promise that by 2030 we want to get to 20 million tons of CO2 reduction. How do we empower every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more? It starts with one. One employee. One developer. One organization. From one employee to a team collaborating with another team. From one organization to their customers 
to their customers' customers. Helping local communities, creating jobs, increasing productivity for the global economy. Our society. Our world. That's the impact. That's the impact. That's the impact each of us can have. That's our opportunity. 100,000 plus employees. 75 million organizations. 7 billion people on the planet. 100 to 75 to 7. To make every small business more productive. To make every large business more competitive. To make nonprofits more effective. To make government institutions more responsive. To expand access to education. To improve healthcare outcomes and to amplify human ingenuity. When we empower every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more, we empower the world. Hello, my name is Eric Nelson. I'm the CEO and Executive Director at the National Nordic Museum. And I'd like to welcome you to the third annual Nordic Innovation Summit presented by Ericsson. Why an innovation and technology conference at a museum? Well, the answer is simple. It's in our DNA. Our institution is guided by four Nordic values, openness, social justice, innovation, and environmental stewardship. Through these programs and this focus, we hope to inspire our audience to create a more just and sustainable world. We had originally imagined this as a one-day program on the topic of Nordic leadership in the areas of sustainability. We sought to gather thought leaders from the Nordic region and the Pacific Northwest for an on-site exchange of ideas. However, with the advent of the COVID-19 crisis, we quickly pivoted to create a virtual experience around sustainability and innovation. With the virtual summit, we aim to attract people from beyond our walls with interest in sustainable solution to the world's most complex issues. This year's Nordic Innovation Summit is provided at no cost thanks to our sponsors. Our presenting sponsor, Ericsson, major sponsors also include Nesty and Microsoft. We also want to thank the session sponsors, Stellar, Scan Design Foundation, Seattle Bank. Other sponsors include Amazon, 
Herzegerten, the Nordic Innovation House, the Embassy of Sweden, the Embassy of Norway in Washington, D.C., and the Consul General Office in San Francisco, the Consul General of Finland in Los Angeles, Rockwool, GeekWire, and the World Affairs Council. Thank you to our sponsors. We would not be able to do this without your generous support. Hi, I'm Reuven Carlisle, a husband, a father, an entrepreneur, and a state senator. It's such an honor to be with you today in celebration and support of the Nordic Innovation Summit. Last year, we opened the conversation at an entirely new level about sustainability, about the relationship between Washington State and the Nordics. And this year, we're taking that even deeper with more insight and more perspective about the next generation of sustainability in our environment, our climate, uh, the moral authority of some of the premier companies in the Nordics and in Washington State, and of course, around the world. I'm asking you to join us in this conversation. Thank you so much for your time and your effort. I'm sorry we can't be together, but at the same time, we know that there's never been a time when science and cognitive reasoning and discovery and the complexity of ideas mattered more than it does now. And that's why this summit matters so much. I want to share with you that organizations like uh, Scan Design and their partner iSustain and so many of the companies here today are representing of that special relationship between Washington State and the Nordic countries. But at the same time, what binds us together is our common belief in science and technology, our common belief in the human value of innovation, the human value of sustainability. It's such an honor to be your partner in service. Thank you for your courage, your humility, your work in making this summit and all the work that it represents a profound success. Thank you. Hi, I'm Mayor Jenny Durkin. I want to welcome you all to this year's virtual Nordic Innovation Summit. Each year, the Nordic Innovation Summit brings leaders together from the Nordic region and the Pacific Northwest to dig deep into global challenges that we are all facing. COVID-19 has been devastating for so many, from small business owners to workers, nonprofits, and everyone in between. But it also has shown us what we can do when we come together and work towards a common goal. Now more than ever, we recognize the importance of coming together as a global community to face some of our generation's biggest challenges. Although we cannot meet in Ballard this year, I'm glad we're still able to come together virtually to share ideas and forge new partnerships to create a new, more sustainable world. In Seattle, our Nordic history runs deep. Our Nordic community has helped shape our city and contributed to the strength and vitality of Seattle in so many countless ways. For over 40 years, the Nordic community of Seattle has shared its history and culture through Ballard's National Nordic Museum, which just last year was federally recognized for its mission of preserving 12,000 years of Nordic history. That 12,000 years of history represents innovations across nearly all sectors, from maritime to education, finance to clean energy. Seattle is proud to be home to the National Nordic Museum and to the Nordic Innovation Summit. I hope this year's summit will provide all of you with the opportunity for meaningful engagement and leave you inspired to tackle some of the world's biggest challenges. Thank you, stay healthy, and remember that we will get through this together and we will build back better. Take care. Hi, I'm Berger Steen, Chair of the Nordic Innovation Summit and uh, a trustee of the National Nordic Museum in Seattle. When we started the museum, or when we opened a new museum to be precise in 2018, um, the trustees and the museum leadership had a very clear intent to show not only the past, but also the present and the future of the Nordic countries to a worldwide and an American and a West Coast audience. And the, the Nordic Innovation Summit was started very much in that spirit. We wanted to connect leaders, policymakers, entrepreneurs, academics across the Atlantic to share experiences and stuff that works. Uh, two important questions for, for today, what can we learn and what can we teach? 
When um, the situation evolved around COVID-19, we obviously thought long and hard about whether we should do this year's summit. And uh, we decided fairly quickly that um, what would be a time when these types of events and these types of exchanges of knowledge could be more important. And hopefully um, we can also bring some a uh, little bit of fun and a little bit of new learning to all of you watching uh, from your homes, many of you still um, sheltering in place. So we have an action-packed agenda for you here today, more about that in, in a second or two, uh, with some of the world's foremost thought leaders in their fields. Uh, we couldn't have done this without our sponsors, so I want to uh, first of all thank our presenting sponsor Ericsson and also uh, Nesta and Microsoft and, and all our other sponsors, whom, many of whom we will meet during the event today. And we've been so lucky this year to be able to invite back uh, the inimitable Robert, Dr. Robert Strand, uh, who is the executive director of the Center for Responsible Business and a lecturer at the Haas School of Business at the uh, University of uh, California at Berkeley. Um, and Robert, you never needed more of an introduction, so please take it away, our MC for tonight. All right. Well, thank you so very much, Berger. It is such an honor to serve as MC for the Nordic Innovation Summit 2020. Uh, I'm here virtually at the National Nordic Museum in Seattle. Uh, now, physically, I come to you from the residence of the Council General of Norway in San Francisco, California. Now, Berger, your introduction was very kind, but you did fail to mention two titles of which I am the most proud. And the first of that is father to Mikkel and Jonas. And the second title that I'm most proud of is Mr. Nordic. The Swedish Consul General in San Francisco, Barbara Osher, gave me that nickname, and I'm quite proud of it because I am an American who draws great inspiration from the Nordics and have dedicated my professional life to raising awareness and understanding of the global leadership demonstrated by Nordic countries and Nordic companies in sustainability. This is the focus of all the classes that I have the privilege to teach at the University of California, Berkeley, and all of my research and writing. So I'm absolutely thrilled to be here today with you all, the global sustainability leaders. Because when we talk about Nordic innovation, we inherently also talk about sustainability, real needs of the world driving innovation. That's what I see from the Nordics. Now, as you know, the very definition of sustainability has deep Nordic roots. Former Norwegian Prime Minister Gro Harlem Brutland chaired the Brutland Commission that generated that timeless definition of sustainable development that we know and still use today. Development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. 2015 saw the launch of these Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs, and in every year since, Nordic countries have dominated the associated SDG index. Now, I know you good Nordic folks are too humble to boast on your performances, so let Mr. Nordic do it for you. You have dominated. And even this colorful SDG logo, this lapel pin, it has Nordic roots also. The Swede Jakob Trollbach designed it. Now, that's not to say that your work is done, because when it comes to SDG number 12, responsible consumption, and SDG number 13, climate action, even the Nordics still have much work to do. Virtually all advanced economies do. But a Nordic approach rooted in cooperation, consensus building, humanism, reverence for democracy, systems thinking, and stewardship is represent our greatest hope to effectively address our greatest global challenges. A Nordic approach focuses on real needs, Meeting real needs is at the core of sustainability, and Nordic Innovation does exactly that. Now, I'd like to share with you a brief story about Nordic Innovation that's most relevant in these current challenging <coughs> times. The Atlantic recently ran an article that was titled, The Doctor Who Had to Innovate or Else. And that doctor was Danish physician Bjorn Ibsen. The innovation was the use of positive pressure ventilation to save polio patients in the early 1950s. Now, at that time, negative pressure ventilation was used for polio patients to breathe, performed by the iron lung invented in the 1920s. 
The entire country of Denmark had only one iron lung. So Ibsen innovated the practice involving hand pumping of ventilators using positive pressure. It would come to save hundreds of lives in Denmark. And drawing from Ibsen's learnings, the following year, the Swedish company, Engstrom, invented a machine that pumped the ventilators mechanically. This is the basis for the modern ventilator. The ventilators used around the world at this very moment, saving lives from COVID-19. A real need, driving innovation. That's Nordic innovation. Now, this may be the first time that you've heard this story, and I think there's likely a healthy dose of Nordic Jantelöven at play here. And the Nordic Innovation Summit is, in part, a way to raise awareness of the incredible innovation climate of the Nordics, to perhaps overcome a bit of that Jantelöven. But I would also like to stress that I don't encourage you to lose your Nordic humility. I think it's a key ingredient for your success. Humility is such an excellent facilitator of collaboration, and many of the greatest Nordic innovations are driven through collaboration and open innovation. So let Mr. Nordic talk on behalf and trumpet your successes, and I will talk very loudly because the world needs your leadership now more than ever. The Nordic Innovation Summit showcases Nordic leadership. Now, some elements today have been recently recorded, and Berger and I will be coming to you live throughout with a number of guests. We're running live on YouTube, Facebook, and LinkedIn, so please post your questions and comments on whatever platform you happen to be on. We'll be following your offerings and drawing them in throughout the day. All right, let's get started. So I'm going to turn it back over to you, Berger, for our first session, uh, and it's focusing on what is going on right now in the Nordic region during this unprecedented COVID-19 pandemic. So please, Berger, take it away. Thank you, Robert. And uh, as we discussed, a key a key mission for the Nordic Innovation Summit is to ask the question, what can we learn and what can we teach? And uh, with that in mind, we've uh, brought together some of the world's leading practitioners and thinkers when it comes to this unique situation that we're all faced with right now. Uh, so without further ado, if we could bring up the panel, uh, we will hear from... Uh, Dr. Cora Mulbach, who's the exec Executive Vice President of Staten Serum Institute. We'll hear from um, economist and crisis specialist, Sven Harald Øygaard, who also was at some point uh, a governor of the Central Bank of Iceland. And finally, of, we'll hear from Alma Muller, who's the Director of Health at the Directorate of Health in Iceland. So we'll start out uh, with Cora, uh, who will tell us a little bit about just in terms of the bare facts, what is the situation right now across the Nordic countries as it relates to the COVID-19 pandemic? Thank you for the kind introduction. I have some slides that uh, I would like to share with you. So could I have the first slide, please? Thank you. So uh, the situation in Shets in a snapshot is that we had the first cases uh, seen from January 26 to February 28. So the first to detect the case was Norway and the last was, was, was Iceland. The situation stayed pretty calm with single cases until we started to import cases from, from Italy and Austria, maybe skiing tourists returning at the end of February and the start of March and from the early March uh, community transmission was recognized in uh, in all of our countries, and we went almost at the same time from uh, from a containment strategy to a, to a mitigation strategy, and we took slightly different routes uh, from that point in time. Uh, but uh, but the commonality was that it was all very proactive. So, so we started to act before uh, we really had a major uh, challenge for our healthcare system. So in Iceland and uh, and in Norway, it was mainly a suppression uh, of the of the outbreak, uh, and uh, whereas in other countries it was more mitigation in order to uh, to sustain a healthcare service throughout the uh, out outbreak. Um, in, in Sweden, they, there was a certain focus on developing herd immunity that was not the case in other countries. Um, and the lockdowns that we introduced uh, were based on a combination of legal and uh, voluntary measures 
In Sweden, it was uh, mainly uh, through voluntary measures, but in all countries, it was a combination of those measures. So, so there are some difference about schools, restaurants, shopping malls, and uh, and the size of mass gathering that was allowed. And we do not have the time to go into details with those. Uh, next slide, please. So these are the numbers. So the key figures is that uh, uh, that now uh, the the epidemic has peaked uh, in in all countries uh, and uh, in many countries it happened uh, already uh, around uh, the first of uh, April. So that's a few weeks after the lockdown was uh, started, uh, and the reproductive number is now low uh, below one which means that on average we have less than one secondary case from a primary case. The recent estimate is around 0.5 in Norway, 0.7 in Denmark, and between 0.8 and 0.9 in, uh, in, in Sweden. You note that the incidence was highest in, in Iceland, and that's not because they had the highest number of cases, but because they had an impressive testing activity from the uh, start and and the uh, and, and the and the incidence measured in cases per 100,000 was lowest in in Finland but but these numbers do reflect the differences in testing activity rather than the the real incidence also note that there's a a, a very great difference in the number of reported deaths so the the uh, mortality was lowest in Iceland and and seems to be highest in uh, Sweden uh, until now with 317 death per million inhabitants uh, in my own country Denmark at uh, at 95 uh, 91 uh, as the second one uh, next slide please so if we want to compare countries we really need to compare apples with apples and not apples with oranges uh, and we have a way to doing that, and that's the Euromom project, uh, which is a project that monitor excess mortality. So, so these uh, time series shows uh, the number of uh, the difference between the number of, of observed death and the expected death. And uh, unfortunately, Iceland is not part of that uh, time series. Uh, but what we see here again is that Sweden stands out uh, with uh, with a uh, high degree of uh, excess mortality. And these are expressed as standard deviation uh, scores, set scores. So these are not actual numbers, but shows how much it's, it's uh, deviates from the average. Next slide, please. So, so, so how can we uh, summarize these uh, results? So we can see that all countries have passed the peak of the epidemic. Uh, the second wave is highly uh, probable in epidemiological terms because uh, most of our population remains in, immune, uh, but I think it's unlikely that it will happen in real because we know what can be done. We know how to make a, a, a lockdown. We know how to do contact tracing, and we have ramped out test capacity uh, due to uh, innovation. So, for example, in uh, in nine days in Denmark, we built a brand new laboratory that can handle 10,000 PCR uh, samples per day. Uh, we have seen no breakdown of the healthcare system, but we see that the different policies lead to different numbers. And in particular, uh, Sweden stands out as having a, a higher burden uh, of uh, of disease uh, mortality in uh, home and home care. Uh, for home elderly uh, nursing homes. Uh, but I think it's too early to judge who took the right choice uh, because we are still in the middle of a pandemic. So so whether Sweden will stand out at the end of uh, 2020 is uh, impossible to say uh, because we don't know what will happen during the autumn. So thank you for your, atten for your attention. been going on, how people actually have behaved in the face of uh, different types of instructions and, and rules uh, from central government. We've invited Sven Harald Øygaard, who yeah. is uh, an economist, a, a crisis specialist, and uh, is also uh, actually releasing his uh, book in the combat zone of finance in the US uh, next week. And uh, if you look at the website for the event, as well as in the chat box on YouTube, you will find the the website for that book where you can also find his blog with some of this material. But Sven Harald, um, 
what can we say about how people have reacted um, to this unique situation across the Nordic countries? Yeah, thank you, uh, Vicky. And I will build on the uh, quarter's points on the on the different routes of the Nordic countries. Uh, so first, allow me on, on slide one. Uh, basically, it shows the trajectory of the disease in the different Nordic countries. So if you go to the next page, please. Uh, so basically, Cross channel, uh, was there a problem with that? Yeah, well, this is the, the three routes. That's the right one. So, okay. So uh, this basically shows very simplified the trajectory of the disease in the, in the different countries in the Nordics, plus the US and the UK for reference. And as mentioned uh, by Kore, Iceland is a very special case. And I think I recommend everyone to look at it. And it, we will also will talk to it later because it's basically the country in the world that has tested the most which means that the numbers from Iceland, in that sense, should be the most representative of all. Uh, of course, they show uh, this immense need for uh, hospital places, 6.5% of those infected, and for intensive care, 1.7% of those infected. It shows a mortality rate uh, for all of uh, 0.1 uh, for the ones below 60, and 3% above uh, for the ones above 60 of, of years, years of age. So it basically gives their representation. Of course, it also shows that the disease can be taken out uh, very simplistically. If you all go to the store, uh, stock up, and then go home and lock the doors for 14 days, uh, the disease will be gone globally after 14 days. That, of course, is not uh, going to happen, uh, which takes us to the different uh, other scenarios. We have Norway uh, that have, uh, together with Denmark, basically marginalized the disease. Uh, then you have uh, Finland and Sweden that have sort of flattened the curve, uh, as mentioned. And uh, especially Sweden has been sort of, uh, of course, that many times mentioned as a special case, because I guess they are one of the few that have kind of declared more or less explicit this objective of flattening the curve and of herd immunity. They basically say that the strategies of Norway, Denmark, and Iceland aren't, aren't robust. They cannot last for long because the world will again open up. And then we have, as you know, the two to the right. These are the, 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 the trajectory of the diseases. On the next page, I go to the trajectory of the policy response. It's a bit uh, complex chart. Uh, it's made by Oxford University. On the X axis, it basically shows the timeline and the Y, y axis shows the harshness of the policy response, basically of the lockdown by country. The, the one in blue on, is Italy uh, on the top and, and Sweden uh, is at the bottom. I think many Swedes will say, well, that's a, um, basically the legislation and the, the firmness of the guidelines isn't that harsh in Sweden, but all the Swedes are expected to do the right thing. So it basically, yeah, as you will see in the next slides, it's not fully representative of the actions in Sweden. The next slide basically shows the population response. And it's a, again, it's a very interesting tool uh, provided by our dear big brother, uh, Mr. Google. Basically shows the change in the, in the movement pattern by country. On the left, uh, basically, uh, the, the workspace activity. So what amount of time and activity people spend at work. Uh, the number two is the kind of um, retail and recreation. Then it's grocery and pharma. Then it's transit stations. And then on the right, you should say residential. So when people aren't at work, they're they are more likely to be at home. And it shows that, uh, of course, South Korea is the kind of success case with uh, track and trace uh, that basically allows them to handle the disease without shows close shutting down society. Then you have Sweden uh, uh, sort of with a modest lockdown uh, and the three uh, other Nordic countries here are kind of in the mid tier. Actually, all with a uh, kind of looser policy as compared to the US, Italy, and especially now UK. Um, as a paradox, the harsher measures, uh, the more mortality. Uh, and of course, that's because um, the kind of root cause analysis goes the other way. <laughs> the, the, the more mortality, the harsh, harsher measures. So of course, the, what you can learn from the Nordics, and I think both Denmark and Sweden, um, Denmark and Norway and Italy in Iceland are now providing interesting examples because this tightening for a period allows now a reopening of society that will be economic activity back where it was. But the impact is, is disastrous. As we go to the next page, uh, which basically shows the unemployment level uh, by country. I mentioned it's difficult to compare um, numbers across countries because uh, yeah, 
So actually here I did a bit different than what's normally. I looked at the unemployment compared to the total population. And of course, the Norwegian numbers are most dramatic. Uh, they just uh, sort of go sky high immediately after the uh, government lockdown on, on March 12. It's good news and bad news. I think one of the Thank reasons you. why they are so high is because the government support schemes are very generous. Uh, they're basically 100% compensation for everyone who loses their job. Um, while uh, in, um, in, in Sweden and Iceland, they have been more focused on ensuring that people stay at their workplaces and they compensate the employee, the em employers, uh, to keep people at work. The U.S. numbers are also put in, uh, shows the kind of, again, the tra tragic trajectory of, of the U.S. While actually a bit surprising, uh, all the numbers from Sweden, Germany and Denmark are at a completely different level. The Iceland numbers uh, are also showing a very rapid increase, but again, because of the policy response of of compensating employees for keeping people at work, uh, they aren't that dramatic. The last page is on yeah, what are the, uh, the direction of the policy uh, response for the different countries. Uh, I try to see if there's something kind of brilliant that has been done, uh, especially with regard to innovation. Uh, I think that hasn't really happened so far. Um, it's something that's now being discussed on, on how can we get out from the crisis modus into a kind of a re rejuvenation um, recovery modus with more focus on the kind of long-term measures. But what has happened so far, of course, a ramp up of, of capacities in the free for all uh, Nordic healthcare systems, which of course has been an important part of why all the countries have been able to manage this in a good way. Uh, in Denmark, Sweden, uh, they have put in place schemes to cover the fixed cost of, cost of, uh, of the companies. And as I mentioned, co-financing by the government, uh, yeah, also of the, of the, um, of lowered rates to the landlord. So if the landlord lowered the rates, the go government basically compensates part of that. Uh, you have governments comp that compensates part of, uh, the, the cost of part-time employment. Uh, expanded, you know, unemployment benefit, uh, deferred tax payments, loan packages, uh, especially when you get sort of private sector co-finance. So basically, so far, uh, the focus has been on compensating whoever loses their job, uh, compensating employers to the extent possible. And then as, as uh, time passes back uh, by, uh, we will see more systematic measures to recreate growth and, and um, support innovation in the Nordic country. Thank you. Thank you, Sun Harald. Uh, suspect there will be food here for thought among academics, social scientists, economists, and others uh, for years, maybe decades to come. But uh, you did say that you were looking for something brilliant that's been done, and uh, that was what we did too. So um, we invited um, Alma Muller, who's the Director of Health, that's Director of Health in Iceland, to give us a more kind of A to Z uh, story about what Iceland has done, because their numbers are, are truly exceptional. So, Alma, please. Yeah, hi, everyone, and thank you for the uh, kind introduction. And uh, can I get my first slide, please? In the meantime, I would like to help uh, thank Mr. Nordic for mentioning Björn Ibsen and Engström, since I am an intensiveist uh, myself. Uh, I don't see my slides, but you do. Yes, it's all good. Okay, but I would like to see them too. <laughs> yeah, uh, let's see if th there is actually a Zoom window that has them, but you may have to flip through them to, to see if you could uh, locate it. Okay, okay. Um, I think a key to the Icelandic uh, response is that we already had a uh, a pandemic national response plan in place. And we also have uh, very clear acts uh, to follow. And I want to add that we also had very good actors that you see and that have cooperated very well. Uh, next, please. And this is the status now. We have only 12 active cases. We have no uh, patient in hospital and only two cases for the last 11 days. Uh, next, please. And as already mentioned, we have tested a lot and more than any other country I know of. Uh, 
and we have also been uh, fortunate not to have uh, very many deaths, 10 deaths and, and low death rates per 100 cases, as you can see. Next, please. Uh, our strategy was to ensure that uh, our infrastructure, especially healthcare, would withstand. And we did that by flattening the curve, by uh, protecting the elderly, by having sufficient PPE and other equipment. And I must uh, say that we never ran out of anything. And we also managed to uh, do a build a reserve squad of healthcare workers. So we used both uh, containment and mitigation. Next, please. And uh, we decided very early on that informing the public was of utmost importance. And we started to give uh, daily press meetings uh, some days before the first case. And I must say that this has been more popular than any soap opera ever seen in Iceland. And we also uh, did this new homepage, COVID.ice, that you can look into. It's in eight languages. And we have published several guidelines. Next, please. And we aimed at early detection. So we had already been tested, testing for uh, about four weeks when we had the first case. And we also uh, got into cooperation with Decode Genetics. It's a private company for extensive screening of the population. And of course, uh, we put all the infected in isolation. Next, please. So we did extensive uh, contact tracing with a team of nurses and police officers. And we also uh, launched an app very early on. And uh, that has led to that 57% of all cases diagnosed were or already in quarantine. Next, please. And these are our social measures. They have not been as extensive as in, in many other countries. Uh, we were very early to put restrictions regarding uh, visiting of, of nursing homes. Uh, we have kept the kindergartens and grammar schools open for the whole time, but with some restriction. And we closed, but we closed high schools and universities. And we had ban of gatherings of 100 and then of 20. Uh, next, please. And regarding healthcare, we have done uh, well, I think. We used mathematical modeling to predict number of cases, need for hospitalization, and need for intensive care treatment. And that was very helpful. And then we did something that I find brilliant. We put together an outpatient clinic that monitored every single infected person in the country. And we did that by telehealth, first by risk assessment, and then with an urgent care center so we could intervene early uh, if the patient was deteriorating. And in uh, my opinion, it's no doubt that this has led to fewer hospital admittances and, and less need for intensive care. And our ICU mortality is low, 10%, and mortality in ventilated patient is 16%. And the next, please. So this is our model, just to show you an example. The solid line is the likeliest prediction, the dotted is the pessimistic, and the red is exponential growth. And the dots are what actually happened. So it has been very exact. Okay, let me know Next. just before we end up. And uh, you mentioned that uh, there wasn't reported any exit, uh, excess deaths. And that's true for Iceland. It, indeed, it is even somewhat lower. So we feel confident that we, we did uh, necessary health care and we didn't uh, miss any uh, COVID cases in the community. And next, please. So I think we have been successful up till now. And uh, these are my thoughts that we are small enough to have short chains of command and be able to act with speed. And it's also has been possible to have oversight and control for the whole time. 
but we are also uh, large enough uh, to provide uh, good health care. And next, please. So these are our next uh, projects. That's, of course, to continue COVID vigilance and care. We have started to measure antibodies. We are trying to get health care uh, back to normal. We are doing research on the effects on public health. And we have already uh, started our exit strategy and we are going to open our borders uh, and test there on June 15. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alma. Uh, it's it's truly a, a fantastic story. And uh, this that should we have time for one question that we've taken on YouTube from the audience. And I think it's one that's that's relevant across the Nordic countries. But uh, I'm going to ask it of you, Alma. Uh, is there any evidence that the opening of schools and daycare centers is fueling an increase of new wave of infections in parents and teachers, if not in the children themselves? No, we see so very few infections in children and the research that Decode Genetics has done shows that it's very unlikely that uh, uh, adults, in that kids infect adults. Indeed, it's the other way around and we haven't closed school, but we have now uh, no restrictions. So it's too early to tell. We, we reopened everything on 4th of May. So um, we should get the answer in some days, maybe. But we don't think it will cause another wave. Thank you. Very short comments, Sven Harald. Sven Harald, I had a question for Alma, because I think it's a very interesting case. Because uh, Iceland has really, as you said, shown how it can be done and it's taken out the virus. At the same time, Iceland is a tourism-dependent economy. So basically, as you said, you have to open your border. So what you do, in that sense, it's a very good illustration of this kind of wave two, what to do the day after. So uh, what's the strategy and, and what's the probability that you actually can keep Iceland in the situation where you are now, given the need to open the economy, given your dependency on tourism? And what can the learn, world learn from that on the trade-offs that we need to face as we go further with the pandemic? It's a super important question, Alma, but uh, I'm going to have to ask you to be, be short in answering it. Okay, so uh, on the 15th of June, we are going to have some different uh, choices for our tourists. They can choose to go to quarantine for two weeks. They can come with a, with a certificate that they have a recent PCR done in their home country or that they have antibodies. And we are also going to uh, screen at the border. So we are going to test this for some weeks and then reevaluate. Re thank you. And thank you, Kåre. Thank you, Sven Harald. And thanks again, Alma, for volunteering to enlighten us on such short notice. Uh, and please uh, stay with us as we'll revisit this uh, uh, topic several times during the day, not least in our final panel. We will be joined by uh, four uh, prominent health tech leaders. I have to leave, but thank you. Thank you very much. So, Robert, how about that? Well, oh, we are going to have, uh, in the future, you're going to see PhD programs that are focused on comparing and considering the Nordic responses to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, absolutely fascinating stuff. Um, now, before we're going to move into a, we'll shortly have a, uh, a sustainability leadership panel, but first, I'd like to uh, take you to hear a word from three of our main sponsors, Ericsson, Nesta, and Microsoft. We've all heard the talk about 5G. And you probably felt like saying, show me something real. So let's get down to the dollars and cents. Take manufacturing. For operators, that's a $113 billion 5G IoT opportunity. Automotive, another $48 billion. 5G equals big business. But we can't only look to tomorrow's revenues. Good news is that investing in 5G infrastructure will boost your mobile broadband bottom line already today. So, how do you make it happen? Well, while we would love to go into millimeter waves, massive MIMO, beamforming, network slicing, and distributed cloud, 
or even our 5G ready baseband 6630. We'll save that for later. So we'll end on this. We're here to help you take the next step towards 5G while also growing your bottom line today. To maximize 4G now with 5G proof products. And now's the time to act. So let's talk. We are running our COVID-19 technology response on Teams. Teams has given us that possibility to continue to innovate. To continue business and to react and to decide action. Bringing up video visits and accomplishing 14,000 visits in a matter of a few weeks. L'Oréal since first day has decided to convert its facilities to produce hand sanitizer. I can bring them in. I can actually share my screen and show the x-rays. Completely agree. This is going to be a game changer for medicine. The university is not only teaching, is research, is building up projects, is creating culture. We care about keeping London safe, keeping the police service going. We're living on teams. It's as simple as that. Yeah, it is amazing how we've all learned to communicate as teams and families under these new circumstances. Or perhaps it's more amazing that we're we're already doing it as if as if it were normal. It's absolutely true. Picking up on uh, the digitization that had been occurring, and now we've gone in a hyperspeed, and the need to further innovate and connect us uh, in these times and thereafter are so incredibly evident. Um, now we've got a really fascinating panel ahead of us here. Uh, we'll be joined uh, to head the panel, Henrik Henriksen, of course, CEO and president of Scania. Uh, and we'll be joined also with Elaine Weidman Grunwald, who's the co-founder of the AI Sustainability Center. And uh, Elaine, I owe you a response. I will happily review your new book. They're going to talk a little bit about this new book, and it is fascinating on sustainability leadership. So let's hear from them. Hello, Nordic Innovation Summit. Uh, we are here in Stockholm, Sweden, at the headquarters of uh, Scania. In, uh, it is in the midst of the COVID pandemic, uh, which has changed uh, the world and, of course, changed a company like Scania as well. Uh, it's quite empty here today. Uh, around 52,000 employees we have around the world, and, and half of them uh, is now actually at home on short-term leave. Uh, but of course, uh, then we're trying to uh, help out in society. So many of our colleagues, they are currently working in other factories to, to build uh, ventilators and other equipment for the hospitals to gear up uh, the capacity, but also helping out in providing procurement and logistics for sourcing to our hospitals in Sweden. Trying to be a global citizen uh, as a company in, in the world today. Of course, this immediate crisis that we are facing is uh, underlying of that that we have also an, a more long-term crisis that is creeping in on us. Uh, and uh, Elaine and myself, we have uh, decided to, to write the book because we believe that there is an emergency on the planet Earth. And, and um, that is the, the sustainability crisis and, and that business can actually do something about it. And we have taken a Swedish perspective uh, with a little bit of Scandinavian touch. Um, because we believe that there is something that we can uh, learn from uh, from Sweden. And, Don't forget uh, the secret sauce. And the secret <laughs> sauce, yeah, we call it that. Uh, that is sort of like the, the untangible things in the Swedish society that's also affecting Swedish corporate life, uh, the way we work with values uh, and, and, and principles and, 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 and uh, also how close we are to nature, but also the, the leadership styles and, and uh, with the delegate responsibility consensus, how that is influencing the whole society and of course also the corporate uh, world. 
But uh, Elaine, tell us a little bit more about this book. Okay, I'll start with the book title, yeah. which is a tongue twister. <laughs> it's called Sustainability Leadership, A Swedish Approach to Changing Your Company, the Industry and the World. That's and, a long title. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and in the book, we, um, we, we took a, I think, quite unique approach. We tried to do two things. One, when it comes back to that secret sauce, we wanted mm. to talk to our peers in, in the industry. And we interviewed, I think, about 25 experts, uh, business leaders ranging from the large industrial companies like Electrolux and, of course, Scania, but also um, startups like Karma and Trine and as other industry leaders like Telia and Sweco, to name a few. Mm. And um, so we're capturing a unique compilation of these different voices, but we also created a model together. Yeah. And um, the model is for not just Swedes, but any company <laughs> anywhere um, that wants to go down a sustainability journey. And, and there's three parts to the model, or three phases. In the first phase, we call the foundation. And this is really about knowing your own footprint um, establishing guidelines and putting a stake in the ground and making it clear what you stand for when it comes to business ethics, for mm -hmm. example. But it's also um, quite a bit about leadership, and it's about tying your purpose together with your culture and your values in creating this sustainability DNA, as we call it in the book, mm. to make sure it's all tying together. So that's the first part of the model. That's like the basics. The yeah. basics. Mm. The second phase of the model is called the core. And this is about embedding sustainability in everything you do in all the ways that you work within a company, starting with R&D through mm. production, um, the way you source products. Sales. Sales, yeah. <laughs> including sales and how you engage with your customer. And, um, and the third part is called the leap. And this is, I think, our favorite part. Yeah, that's when the magic happens. <laughs> and the magic. And the leap is really about um, setting a bolder vision and really going for it as a leader and, and using your personal leadership platform as a way to uh, galvanize the troops around you and going further in, in not just having your footprint in order, but really thinking about how will you transform your industry and even the world. And what legacy you're going to leave as and, a leader. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's a perfect segue back to you, Henrik, to talk about how you see the leap from taking the leap from a Scania perspective. Yeah, and, and I think Scania is one of the examples uh, throughout the book. And, and uh, of course, Scania, we, we are um, a company that is trying to push and, and, and drive the shift towards a more sustainable transport uh, system. We uh, believe a lot that you have to build in sustainability into the core of the company. Um, even if we are a hard to abate industry, we represent close to 20% of the CO2 emissions in the world. That is the transport ecosystem. Um, there's still a lot of things that we can do. And, and uh, I think throughout the book, we are sharing some of the, the examples of, of how that can, uh, can happen. Very much with science as, as a backdrop and, and, and a sort of a cornerstone in, in using science as, as the, the foundation. Uh, but there is a lot of good other examples in the book. We have Northvolt, a, a Swedish startup uh, that is now building the greenest battery factory on planet, uh, providing the automotive industry. Interesting to see how they are building in sustainability into their values from day one and how that is shaping all the decisions, uh, including the stakeholders of investors. Uh, and, and uh, people working in the company. But also Houdini, uh, a outdoor wear company that you will hear more about on the panel Did later on. Did you get a power hoodie? Yeah, the hoodies there, <laughs> um, and beautiful clothes. But uh, I mean, they, they, I think, are a shining example in the book of gone very far when it comes to the leap, the third part of, of the journey, and how they have integrated even thoughts around planetary boundaries together with Stockholm Resilience center uh, in, in how to build in uh, sort of new lenses on, on how to look upon their world into their business strategy. But it's not only about best practices, there's also about sort of the, the next leap when it comes to sustainability, which is probably digital. Yeah, that's right. We, we think that um, we also need to be thinking about the next sustainability frontier as, as we go on as companies. And, and one of the really 
challenging areas will be digitalization because as we know, digitalization pervades every part of our society, our work life, our home life, our homes are connected, our kids are connected, everything's connected, which is of course amazing and, and will be probably one of the most important um, accelerators of sustainable transformation. So we're very mm. pro digitalization, but we also think that we also should be thinking about the other side of the coin, which comes in terms of um, privacy intrusion and the use of data and digital how- Digital pollution. Digital pollution is yeah. the term we talk about and really needing to know uh, what those risks are because it's it's a you know new area for many companies. Um, companies are typically digitalizing in order to find efficiency gains or create new revenue streams. But we're saying there's a third piece of that pie and that's that we also need to think about what's the impact on people in society and take um, steps to ensure that that's a positive impact and not the negative one because we want all those great things that Microsoft will tell us on the mm. panel when it comes to uh, saving the planet with AI and we also, you know, even if we come back to the pandemic, which um, you started in the beginning, there's a lot of apps, health apps, tracing, um, playing a vital role in contract t tracing and that kind of thing for the pandemic. But we also need to know how is that health data, personal data going to be stored, used in the future and make sure that we're building in privacy protection. So it's not all doom and gloom, but we think there's a, a level of responsibility where we need to see more companies step up. But there's also a good example in the book about Telia. Uh, Telia is working with data insights with cities in Sweden and one of the big bets Telia is making is that um, preserving, helping to preserve privacy rather than exploiting it will, play, will pay off as a trust premium in the long run. And so we, we describe a, in detail a great case about how Telia is um, working on that from a product development point of view. Coming back to um, uh, the current situation, I think the, the pandemic that we are experiencing now is a wake-up call. Uh, and I think when we are able to restart the economy and restart society, uh, we have a golden opportunity to do, do that in a sustainable way, uh, to make sure that the foundation we're building, all the decisions, all the investments, everything we do should be based on sustainability. It is all about leadership at the end of the day, and I think that is what's described in the book. Uh, it starts and ends with leadership. And, and we hope that uh, when we're going to do this restart, that it's going to be more sustainable in society. If you're a leader in the corporate world or if you're a leader in general, uh, this book could be a helpful tool for you and give you some inspiration. Uh, if you have the ambition to change your company, uh, to change your industry, and to change the world. And the book will be available in September. But for now, we'd love everyone to join us in the panel where we're going to hear from some of the business leaders that feature in the book and hear about some of the big, bold goals that uh, business leaders are taking already today. Henrik and I just finished writing a book about corporate sustainability leadership in Sweden. And we heard a rumor, or rather we're starting a rumor, that there might be some kind of secret sauce to sustainability in the Nordics. So that's going to be the focus of our panel today. And we're going to hear about how some of the companies we interviewed and some of the experts um, will share their perspectives on just what's happening here in the Nordics. And we have a great panel with us today. Uh, we have uh, Oswald Bieland. Uh, with us, uh, who's the CEO of uh, Sinteo. Uh, we have Eva Carlson with us, who's the CEO of uh, Houdini. We also have Kimberly Lane uh, Matheson with us, who's the general manager for Microsoft in uh, Norway. So we think we're going to have a lot of uh, interesting input coming in from those panelists today. And, and I will ask them to just briefly introduce themselves uh, for one minute uh, and, and their company. And if we uh, start with uh, you, Eva. Yes, happy to be joining. Uh, my name is Eva and I work for Houdini Sportswear, which is a Swedish outdoor brand. Uh, we, we work on 20 markets worldwide um, and create products that brings us out in the backcountry. Um, and uh, we've been working with sustainability for more than 30 years, actually, and it's is an integral part in everything we do at Sudini. 
Okay, thank you, Eva. And if we go over to uh, to Norway then, uh, where we have uh, Oswald. Thank you very much, Henrik. My name is Oswald Bieland. I'm the founder of uh, and CEO of Centeo, and we focus on sustainable growth for large multinational companies uh, in the US, Europe, and India. Okay, thank you, Oswald. And, and in Norway, we also have uh, Kimberly sitting in Oslo. Hello, everyone. Kimberly Line Matisson. I'm the general manager for Microsoft in Norway, but here representing the Nordics. Microsoft is a, a large cloud-based technology platform. We build our platforms so that any number of companies of any size anywhere in the world can build their technology on our platform. Up here in the Nordics, we have a, a pretty big footprint we're proud of, over 2,000 people um, working directly for us. That's also 50,000 people plus employed by our partners, but working directly with our technology. We have a quantum research center up here in Denmark. We have two global development centers, one in Oslo and one in, uh, in Denmark as well. And we have a data center footprint, our two large regions open in Norway already, and we're building in Sweden. So we have a lot going on. And with that footprint, sustainability is, is high on the agenda. Okay, thank you very much, Kimberly. So I think we'll kick off and, and go into uh, a couple of more uh, deep dive questions. And, and I would like to start with uh, asking you, Eva. I mean, uh, uh, learning a little bit and understanding uh, more about Houdini in in, uh, in the research we have done and also from the book that uh, Elaine was referring to, I think it's, it's clear to see that you have really built uh, uh, sustainability into your business model. And, and I think you have even pushed it that far that you have introduced planetary boundaries uh, into your uh, strategy. Can can you share some thoughts on that with us, Eva? Yes, I think um, maybe the the, the reasons uh, for um, for having sustainability at, really at the core of everything we do. Uh, there are several, but I would like to start just by saying that it's it seems to me intuitive in the way we work. And at least two reasons that I'd like to share is, first of all, um, our ambition is really to create value for all. And we don't see, um, we don't even understand how business could have a lesser of an ambition in terms of creating value for only a few at the expense of others. So in that sense, creating value for all, that takes um, a systemic approach to sustainability and that social, ethical and environmental sustainability. And it sounds maybe like um, a negative approach, but for us, it's really been the way we develop our business, the, the way we look upon our potential to, to do more, create more value for our customers, ourselves, but also to the world. So, and then the second part is having a core values that truly form keel and rudder for everything we do. It's we say that we want to do good, play hard, push boundaries and have fun. And and pushing boundaries, that's a lot about uh, progressing, questioning ourselves in the way we've been working, but also questioning conventions in society and uh, making sure that we always evolve. It's a living system and we're part of it and we have to evolve and make sure that uh, we stay interconnected and uh, learn and also share. So. Yeah, that, those tell, are two at least two examples of why yeah. I think it's intuitive for us. Can you can you share also that uh, um, you, you worked closely together with science? We know also and, and and thought about sort of planetary boundaries. Can you just briefly sort of mention uh, how how that came up? Yes, uh, to have a, a science based uh, framework to lean against uh, to truly understand our impact as a company now. And understand that at, a, uh, at the systemic level so that we also can understand how to improve. That was, uh, that is essential, of course. And we could never do that uh, by ourselves, but to, to collaborate with the actual Earth system scientists was um, a step we took in 2015. And uh, an amazing step because uh, it gave us a lot of insight, uh, a roadmap ahead. And um, I think it also helped us become much more creative. Mm, okay. 
Thank you very much, um, Eva. We'll come back to you later on, but uh, I'll move over then to you, Oswald. Um, I mean, uh, there is a lot of challenges that uh, we're facing today. We have the COVID pandemic, and then we have, of course, the, the climate change uh, that has been ongoing for a long time. Uh, and I think you've been an advocate for sort of um, unprecedented leadership and how you create change. And you have also been in the forefront when it comes to um, creating influencing platforms. Uh, could, you, could you share us a little bit of uh, why you thought of those things from the beginning and, and, and how you have developed that over time? Yeah, thank you very much, Henrik. First uh, of all, uh, congratulations and thank you for taking the initiative uh, to write the book. Um, I think that the Nordics uh, has a lot to offer, actually. If you look at the uh, industrial practices in, in uh, across the countries, um, we have uh, experienced crisis before. I remember as a young man, uh, Black Monday, 1997, we have seen 9-11, uh, we have seen uh, many of these uh, challenges. Um, what we, however, experience today is, of course, an enormous challenge for our entire human family. And it, it cu cuts across the entire globe. So it is different. However, I personally don't believe this is an extinction event. I think we, once again, we are hardwired and we will come out of this as a learning individuals and move forward in, in good ways. However, uh, on this question of platforms and leadership, I do believe that the, the coronavirus will burn off uh, before too long or in some time. Um, but we will be straight back to the fundamental problem for how we basically have structured uh, our economy since the times of Adam Smith. So in the last 100, 150 years, of course, the progress has been enormous. But we see that the very growth model, the way we have set ourselves up, has some very profound problems. And the one is the, the conflict between man and nature, the few and many, and the short and long term. Um, so the question is then, how do we address these systems problems, systemic problems, whether it's being the transport system, the healthcare system, the food system, etc. And the way we, the reason why we have put together, for example, Europe delivers with a number of world leading companies focusing on systems change in Europe or in India in the 2022 is the fact that we need unprecedented cooperation to basically be able to understand these systems challenges, identify the systems optionality, and then drive the transformation. These are very, very hard problems to solve. And as far as I can see, there are very few who can do this alone. Even the world's largest companies can't do it alone. So this very essence of cooperative leadership, leaders who are able to form action-based partnerships is an ingredients of quite enormous uh, uh, importance for us all over the short, medium and long term. Mm. And, and of course, one way to get traction uh, in, in this uh, change model that you describe and the need for change uh, is, is, of course, to work with different kinds, kinds of influencing platforms. Sinteo is one of them. Can you tell us a little bit more? Yes. So what we believe, uh, since our mission is to drive systems transformation at scale, is that we need to create platforms where people can come together. And uh, um, um, basically what we do is that we find a problem which is worthwhile working on. It could be the food system. It could be the transport system, the bioeconomy, et cetera. And then we look for exceptional leaders who can carry the torch and bring others with us. And then we put together a project. But you see, um, and we have a number of very exciting examples of huge progress in this space. But by and large, it is very difficult because we all have been trained to optimize the parts rather than transforming the system into something new. Mm. And I'm sure that my esteemed colleagues from Microsoft and others here on the, on the call have a lot of experiences in both how to do that and also the challenges um, I think that, you know, if you, if you look at some of the most remarkable companies, the top 15 companies in the last 25 years, they have all been, they're all great because they're able to drive systems transformation at scale via exceptional leadership. So this is a very, and also those companies outperform in the stock market. So it's really <laughs> worthwhile fighting for, but it's not easy. Okay, good. Thank you, Oswald. Thank you.
Great. So I think you picked up on a, a few themes there that we can continue with on the need for um, systems change and some of the problems, whether it's COVID or climate change. I think we need to see more engagement of the private sector. And um, Kimberly, earlier this year, Microsoft set some pretty tough, visionary, bold goals, really going for um, more of an exponential impact uh, with those targets um, than incremental. Could you maybe talk a little bit about what those targets are and, and how Microsoft sees these challenges? Yeah, I'd, I'd be delighted to. And, and, you know, speaking of the need to move systems, um, there's no question for any of us, I think, how very fundamental data is becoming and the growth within this sector and the oppor opportunity that it represents makes all of us a part of a, a really giant system with a giant opportunity to have an impact. And, and that's why it was so um, wonderful to see Microsoft step forward. You know, I've been with the company four years. In my view, we've always been a company that is taken responsibility for moving the agenda forward also on climate. But I loved um, and, and so many of us felt so passionate and applauded when the company launched its very bold goals, took a real step, step up into what is uh, undeniably a very strong leadership position um, in our industry and across industries when we made our announcements. So those targets are, are around what we were already working to accelerate um, by 2025, getting our entire data center footprint, our entire company footprint over to 100% renewable energy. We're well on the way to doing the new bold ambitions that came in though, went well beyond that. So by 2030, we've committed to go carbon negative and that's with all three scopes included. So to go carbon negative will demand an awful lot of technological progress, but it uh, is, a, is a step on a journey to something much more ambitious indeed. And that is by 2050, we've made a commitment to pull back all of the carbon that we've ever put into the atmosphere uh, since our company's beginning, which was in 1975. And truth be told, um, we have a lot of smart people and our ecosystem is filled with an amazing amount of intelligence, but none of us yet know how we're gonna meet those goals. And so one of the things we also announced was a $1 billion climate innovation fund aimed precisely at doubling down and truly accelerating the answers to how we're gonna get to that truly deeply carbon negative um, opportunity. So that's gonna involve investments and discoveries that, uh, that the world uh, doesn't know yet, but uh, we're going to have to pursue them at pace to make this happen. Incredible. And in the beginning, um, when, you, when you made your introduction, you mentioned the 50,000 partners that you're working with. Is there something in these goals that involve your broader ecosystem and in, in your, your different channels when it yeah. comes to sustainability? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, one of the one of the ways that we transform or that we can provide leadership, make it make an impact is, of course, through that large ecosystem that we're a part of. And in fact, that ecosystem is there to lift companies. And we all see more and more how very closely technology and sustainability hang together. And so it's absolutely critical that we lift in a big way those technology led agendas at companies, which also are in many ways their best levers to really go forward in terms of sustainability. And one example of a very broad collaboration, a systems led approach and an incredibly bold idea is this, uh, is this initiative we just launched within the last two weeks. It's, uh, it's that we're going to build something we call a planetary computer. And you should say, what on earth is a planetary computer? <laughs> said very shortly, it's, uh, it's a real ambition to bring the world's data together um, like it has never been brought together before. We have a cloud platform. We have all the artificial intelligence today to make an enormous dent in the problem. And if we put those to good use and try to consolidate, provide a consolidating platform where we take in lots of data, apply the best to it, satellite imagery, every kind of data you can imagine, and then provide those insights back out into the broader community, serving as an open platform for everyone to build on together. 
if we can do that, we can link together so many more of these very unanswered questions around what have you, biodiversity or man-made impact, cause and effect that we so dearly need to understand better. So that's a that's a bold idea that I, I'm, I'm delighted to be participating in building. Well, thanks to Microsoft for trail trailblazing through some of these bigger ex existential threats. Um, I think we're going to need much more collaboration. Um, time flies when you're having fun, and we're coming into the final minutes of the panel. So we thought we would just wrap up and come back to the Nordic theme and the, and the Nordic approach here and ask each of the panelists, what's the one piece of advice you would give to other leaders? And do you think there's something special about the Nordics that can be exported to other parts of the world? And um, Kimberly, maybe we could just have a quick comment from you and we'll we'll pass to the others. You're in a US company, but still very much showing the Nordic leadership in, in Norway. Is there one yeah. quick piece of advice you'd want to yeah. give? Well, my quick piece of advice, I would say, you know, we've made good progress as leaders understanding where technology can take us. And so I would follow that. If I, my advice to business leaders is to take that technology lens, everything you've learned about it, and then go one step farther and extend your next question to your teams as you work with them, to your ecosystem and say, how can that technology then take a step, a step change forward also on circular economy or on business processes, on sustainability. There's so much sustainable value lying in there if we follow that technology strand. And, and to the point about, um, things happening in the Nordics. It's been such a pleasure to actually um, be a part of serving up a whole lot of initiatives um, in our energy sector. That's one of the best examples where we see right across the Nordics, incredible innovation and an innovation that's way ahead of many other parts of the world. So we we have absolutely things to keep building on and, and this technology sustainability combination is truly powerful for us. Thanks so much. Thanks. Oswald, quick word from you or in the last, uh... 90 seconds here. Yeah, yes, uh, a very quick comment is uh, leadership. We have seen in the Nordics over years uh, leaders who have shown enormous courage and uh, enormous innovation in all our Nordic countries. And I think there's one piece of advice from me is to see this very moment we are in now as an unprecedented opportunity for renewal, innovation and new progress, a different kind of progress than what we have experienced before. And then I think the future will be pretty exciting. Thanks so much. Eva, over to you. Well, I think um, my biggest source of inspiration and uh, understanding of a system, a perfectly working system, complex uh, like no other, is nature itself. And to make sure that we protect nature and make sure that we learn from it. And biomimicry is a... It's a word that maybe more of a, more or less everyone knows, but to actually apply that to business uh, in terms of collaboration, interconnectedness, and so forth. There, there's plenty to learn there. Super. And Henrik, are we on the right track here? Would you like to tie it up? <laughs> yeah. No, I thank you to a great panel. I think a lot of uh, positive uh, and forward-looking uh, uh, insights. Uh, I'm really proud of the contribution that you have given today. And, and I think that... Uh, it seems like we can all agree that uh, even if we're a tough crisis now at the moment, uh, this is actually uh, a springboard for for uh, a new world and a new change and, and, and new thinking. And I think you have had some three really great examples of that today. So thank you very much for a great panel. And, and uh, thank you, Elaine, as well. Thank you, Henry. Oh, okay. Thanks, everyone. Thanks have a great day. Best. Thanks, everyone. Thank Bye. Well, uh, Elaine and Henrik, we need to have you at the University of California, Berkeley, in some way, shape, or form, uh, talking about your new book. That is absolutely fascinating stuff. Um, and Elaine, you mentioned, the, is there a secret sauce to the Nordics? And I think, indeed, we're, we're realizing, yes, there is something special. And I just have to point out, Ava from Houdini mentioned planetary boundaries. And planetary boundaries, guess where it comes from, friends? Of course, it comes from the Nordics, the Stockholm Resilience Center, and Oswald mentioning unprecedented collaboration that's needed. That's something that we see very special in a Nordic context. Okay, I'm excited. I'm gonna have to calm down just a little bit here. Uh, before we go to the sponsor keynote from Ericsson to uh, talk about the world of 5G, we have some very uh, distinguished representatives of the Nordic countries, the Embassy of Sweden, Embassy of Norway, and Consulate General of Norway, and Consulate General of Finland, 
as supporting some uh, sponsors of this summit, and we're going to hear a few words from them. Hi, my name is Karnula Stotter. I'm the Swedish ambassador to the United States. I really wish that I could have been at the Nordic Museum in Seattle at the Innovation Summit, but we all know that's not possible. So we have to meet virtually instead. Uh, instead of uh, going to Seattle, I'm now standing in our smart mobility exhibit here at the House of Sweden, where we focus both on successes in Swedish innovation, but also failures, because if you don't fail, you will never be successful. Here, for instance, you can see a smart uh, breathalyzer for truckers, and it's contact-free, very good post-corona. We also have our biggest failure when it comes to mobility, the Vasa ship that was built in Stockholm, took three years to build, 1628, it was on its virgin voyage, sank within the hour. It was lying at the bottom of the sea for about 300 years, was picked up, also very innovative technique, put in a museum and is the most visited museum in Stockholm. So with those few words, I really wish you to have a good seminar. I can't wait till we meet next year in Seattle. Until then, stay safe and wash your hands. Good morning, everyone. Let me start by thanking Birgir, Eric and the whole team for organizing this year's edition of the Nordic Innovation Summit. Despite the difficult situation due to the pandemic, it's encouraging to see the collaborative spirit you all show in organizing the virtual summit. Working together across the Atlantic to promote innovation solution is more important than ever. All the knowledge, insight and creativity that comes out of this summit strengthen the strategic, technological and commercial ties between us and make us stronger. Let me highlight one concrete example which is the close cooperation between Washington State and Norway on electrifying the Puget Sound ferries. When we are to reopen and rebuild our economies, I believe we have a unique opportunity to go green through innovation and technology. I'm looking forward to today's program and I look forward to the next time we can all meet in Seattle. Best of luck onwards and stay safe. Dear friends, this is what innovation and the Nordics is all about. The essence of technology is uh, that when something disrupts your plans, innovate, recreate, uh, tackle it from a different angle, do it differently. And that is exactly what we are doing here today, right now. Thank you all for those of you who has been uh, instrumental in all setting up all this. Chairman Beria, uh, Eric and Eric from the museum and the dynamic duo of Olte and Matti. History does not remember those uh, who wanted to maintain the status quo and do everything as it's always been done. You have shown, you have really shown, uh, that uh, if there's a will, there is a way. Why can we Nordics do this? Uh, because our societies are based on a good combination of uh, uh, entrepreneurship, innovation, and a little bit of a twisted and experimental minds, mixed with values. Yes, values. It really matters what we stand for what we do, who we are, everything stems from the Nordic values. Values also mean that when the going gets tough, the tough gets going. Simply those who understand that there's a little difference between opportunity and obstacle uh, are able to turn both into their advantage. We learn and adapt constantly. Today's learning is also that the weight of a hipster is an Instagram. And now the Innovation Summit is online, virtual or whatever you want to call it. But it is and remains an institution. Next year we do it again. How? We don't really know, but we know that we are going to do it. Together we are stronger. Together we are the Nordics. My name is Stefan Lindström. I am the Consul General for Finland on the west coast of the US. Have a great summit, everyone. from the Finnish Consul General, don't you think, Robert? Absolutely, and, and really innovation is questioning the status quo, creating something new, overcoming those obstacles, and being adaptive, and through that, resilient. That's a great lead in to our next speakers. They're a percentage type of company that we really like at, here at the summit. It's a Nordic global leader 
um, small home markets mean that companies have to go to lose relevance or go global early. And uh, global is just what Ericsson has become. It was founded as a small manufacturing shop in Drottninggatan, Fifton, and then <laughs> Femton or 15, in Stockholm in 1876. And today, uh, they are truly a global leader in supplying communications technology to the world's service providers. We have Peter Linder and Bushan Joshi here today. And they're going to talk about both 5G and what Ericsson is doing as a leader in sustainability. Take a look. Welcome to this session by Ericsson uh, here at the Nordic Innovation Summit. Uh, we're going to talk about 5G and uh, sustainability today. My name is Peter Linder. I'm heading up 5G marketing for Ericsson. And with me today, I have Bushan. Hey, this is Bushan Joshi. I lead uh, Ericsson Sustainability and Corporate Responsibility Program in North America. Really happy to be here and have this conversation with Peter. So I'll start by kicking off a question to you, Bushan. What, yeah. what, are, what are the goals and objectives for Ericsson's uh, activities in the sustainability area? Yeah, um, you know, I'm super proud of my company. Um, Ericsson is a global sustainability pioneer. We have about 25 years of history of commitment to sustainability and corporate responsibility, really kind of starting with the first environmental report that we published in 1993. You know, we were one of the first companies to adopt the UN Sustainable Development Goals, really measure the impact of our company on society. Um, we set science-based targets in 2017. And just last year, Ericsson has announced to be completely carbon neutral uh, for our company operations by 2030, so in the next 10 years. Um, and this is a journey, Peter, you know, you know this, we have been on this journey for some time, and this journey is really informed by science and data for us. Um, and our focus from a programmatic standpoint is on, is on three areas. The first one is responsible business, so we're really focused on being proactive on this agenda, going beyond legal compliance, making sure that we integrate really high occupational health safety standards, um, you know, focus on responsible sourcing, really become a trusted partner for the customers and the stakeholders we interact with. The next pillar is climate action. So here we're taking into account the impact our company's operations have, but then also being very attentive to the impact of our products on society. Um, and the final one is digital inclusion, you know, accessibility and connectivity and accessibility to broadband uh, is really important. It's a key enabler of economic development. So we really do a lot of good work on advocacy, on making sure that we're connected to those that are unconnected and bringing STEM education to children early in their life so they better be able to participate in the technology revolution that's coming up. So, you know, this kind of gives you an example of what Ericsson has been doing and where we are now from a sustainability standpoint. So Peter, um, can you tell us a little bit about what is 5G and how is 5G going to change the way we live and, and live our life and the way we work? Yeah, so 5G is an extra nation mobile networks. We introduce a new generation roughly every 10 years. And uh, it's easy to view 5G just as a faster horse. So mm -hmm. something a little bit quicker than what we already have. I would argue that is 5G is transformational. It's as important for digital mobility as the car was for physical mobility 100 years ago. And to give me a few examples why I believe it is that, if you look at the the 5G is going to transform both consumer and business. So the first technology to address both at the same time. The consumer piece, we're going to transform in the way that we're going to get higher quality uh, of video to, to our mobile devices. Think 4K, 3D, 360, for di different experiences with video. The second thing is we'll be able to do stream games to these devices. Streaming of game to these devices with the computing power at the edge, instead of having everything crammed into a $3,000 computer. And the third element, which I think is going to be transformational, which is virtual mixed and augmented reality, where those devices, where we can untether them, we can cut off the wires to the desktop that they are attached to today and run them when we are out and about. Not only will 5D change for consumers, it will also change for businesses in a material way. The reason why businesses are interested in 5G is they want a reliable, secure, high-performance wireless network so they can reuse dependencies either on wired alternatives or wireless that can't, doesn't necessarily take them all the way up to, to, to the mark. 
Now we've been used to connecting all kinds of things around us. We want to measure things in business processes. And we'd also be used to actually, like for example, in production of a car, you don't have to have all the electronics in the robot itself. You can move that to an edge at somewhere at the manufacturing plant and then have simpler robots and having the robots talking to the, uh, the compute resources. So these are a few examples of things that 5D will bring and transform both consumer and business. So Busan, what about connectivity for climate action and sustainable development? What, what role will connectivity play there? Yeah, so great question, Peter. So we need to make this transformation on all sectors of our economy, including the power sector. So if you think about the power sector or the energy energy sector, what's really been happening in the last couple of uh, years and a decade is it's this change both on the supply side and the change on the demand side of the equation. So on the supply side, what we're seeing is that there's a lot more renewable energy sources that are coming online. And then on the demand side, you see a lot of different ways in which energy is being used that's changed. So now we have a lot of people with electric cars that are plugging them in at night. So it's just the patterns have shifted, right? So now when you have to have a grid that is becoming increasingly more and more dynamic, you have more sources of energy, people have solar panels on their roofs, um, you know, how do you connect with all of these different dynamic sources of energy and dynamic sources of energy use and be able to balance them in a proactive way so that you're able to maintain that balance between supply and demand. So that's really what we need to do and connectivity is the exact solution to do that. So if you think about 5G and the connectivity solutions that we provide or Ericsson provides, you know, it gives the grid operators the ability to rapidly and securely connect with multiple sources, act rapidly to balance the sources and balance the power usage too. So it really allows them to, you know, to, to, to maintain that very thin balance that they need to maintain to meet the needs of today from a power usage perspective, but then also achieve the objectives of transforming our uh, transforming the energy sector towards a more renewable future that's needed to take climate action. So Peter, can you tell us a little bit about where are we with the rollout of 5G in North America? Um, has the recent COVID uh, pandemic impacted the rollout? So the rollout of 5G in uh, North America is happening in three different uh, ways. First one, we, we're building for coverage, nationwide coverage. We're using low band spectrum, which is the same spectrum that we use for 1G, 2G, and also been used for TV, certain TV channels, now being reformed or, or created so that we have that spectrum for, for coverage. That'd be essential as we're targeting to reach 95% of US farmlands by 2025. The second piece is about uh, capacity in urban areas. Here we're using mid-band spectrum that are used for 3G and 4G, sometimes even combined 3, 4G and 5G together with dynamic spectrum sharing. And uh, this is great spectrum for, for, uh, for capacity in urban areas. Here we also will see additions of spectrum with the likes of CBRS, uh, Citizens Broadband Radio Services, and new spectrum in the C-band later this year. The third area that's going on is for creativity. Creativity in zones, either where there's a lot of people in, in, in one physical location, or we can uncover new business, uh, un, 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 unserved business needs. So mm -hmm. that is done with millimeter wave, reach shorter, that's where we have the, the highest uh, capabilities. Uh, when we look at this as a whole, uh, the industry is pushing forward right now to building 5G at full, full speed. Of course, it's a little bit more complicated by by, by uh, COVID, but I wouldn't say that it's been slowing down significantly in any way. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, so I would say that almost according to plan. But as we build this, one of the key challenges that we're having here that's often talked about is like the carbon footprint of this 5G network. Mm -hmm. All previous network generations have increased the um, uh, the power consumption in the network. What can we do to 5G to change that, or what? What do you see it will look like? Yeah. So, so you know, it's exactly right. Every time we have seen this in the past with new generation of technology being launched, we've provided more coverage, more services to more people. Um, so, if we deploy 5G in the same way that we've deployed the networks before, then yes, the energy cost and the carbon carbon emissions that come with it will go up. Um, you know. So, what we really need to do. And it's a challenge that's facing our industry is how do we quadruple the data traffic without increasing energy usage and carbon emissions? Um, 
So our sector is kind of doing this in two ways. So number one, using renewable energy to power data centers and to power networks. Um, power is one of the main sources of emissions for, for the digital industry. So, you know, you've seen customers of ours like T-Mobile and other companies in the tech sector like Amazon and Microsoft, they've made huge commitments to move towards renewables, towards 100% renewable energy for their businesses. So that's kind of addressing that challenge. But the other challenge is, you know, around mobile network efficiency. So how do we, again, quadruple data traffic without increasing energy consumption? Um, and we call that concept breaking the energy curve. Um, so, you know, what Ericsson has done is we have developed a, a framework called breaking the energy curve. And, and this has kind of five key elements. So the first one is preparing the network. So, you know, we have a lot of, uh, a lot of hardware out there that is 2G, 3G or 4G. So really moving that and modernizing it towards a more energy efficient 5G hardware is kind of the key to kind of set the stage. Then once you have that, you know, start activating energy saving software features that allow the network to go to sleep when it's not needed um, and then build 5G with precision. So, you know, dimension it right. So, you know, don't over dimension, use the right equipment in the right place. Um, and then finally doing things like operating the site more efficiently and more intelligently by using technologies like AI and machine learning to really optimize how all of the, all of the site elements are connected and all of those site elements are being monitored um, and tweaked to proactively drive the energy efficiency and energy performance higher. Um, but that's just kind of about how, uh, you know, about breaking the energy curve. Um, Ericsson is also taking this, you know, more uh, more proactive approach on this. So we have uh, established what are called as product-specific sustainability goals. So Ericsson has set a target to have a 5G portfolio that's 10 times more efficient uh, per data transfer than the current 4G portfolio by 2022, so in two years. Um, and also in that same horizon, we have set a commitment to develop or ensure that our new Ericsson radio system is 35% more energy efficient than the legacy portfolio that we had again by 2022. So, you know, kind of taking a look at what Ericsson has made commitments around 5G um, and, and efficiency, and then really adopting this framework of breaking the energy curve, you know, we're confident that, you know, we can deploy 5G in a more sustainable way um, and meet the demands of the data traffic, but then also keep the carbon emissions in check. Um, so, so Peter, that was kind of a little bit more about, you know, 5G um, and energy. Can you tell us a little bit about, you know, what is Ericsson doing to advance 5G network deployments in North America? I guess we've been pushing forward on a number of different fronts. The first one was standardization. Uh, we pushed forward the standard by 12 to 18 months. So instead of coming out in 2020, it came out in 2018. That's been the key to deploy 5G networks early. Second thing we're doing is... Uh, we're developing the ecosystem here in North America with an initiative we call D15. Uh, and if you think about the ecosystem, it used to be very simple. It was smartphones, it was networks, and it was data centers mm -hmm. with, with our apps. Mm -hmm. uh, going forward, as we're involving more and more industries in 5G, this ecosystem is growing, and it requires a lot of collaboration and co-creation of use cases early on. That is what mm -hmm. we do in the D15 labs. The third thing that we've been doing, we've brought design and open new design centers here in the U.S. We think it's important to design in the U.S. close to where our key customers are, especially in some of these areas of ASIC and software design for, for our, our radios and artificial intelligence, where we have a lot of talent here in the U.S. The fourth area is how we produce our uh, equipment. We have established a new factory here in, uh, in the Dallas area where we can design uh, and develop or produce the 5G radios. So by producing the radios locally and also using 4G and 5G in the factory to create the smart factory, we're, we're trying to, we wanted to create a showcase for how we best can produce, not only produce 5G radios, but innovating the way we produce them as a showcase for other industries to watch. And the fifth element is very much tied to, we have one of the shortcomings here in the US is that we're going to build a million small cells or poles. And that's to be compared with the 300,000 macro cells that we have roughly in, 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 the, in the country. In order to do that, we need a lot more trained people that can go out and deploy this in new ways. So we've taken a very active role in developing talent and hiring that talent so we can be the ones building these networks down the road. So those are five mm -hmm. things that we've done. 
So that's few examples on the five year side. Could you give us some examples on the uh, on the sustainability side, uh, how we're leveraging connectivity there? Yeah, so I'll talk about connectivity in the transportation sector. So transportation accounts for approximately 21% of the global carbon emissions. So it's really key for us to integrate sustainability and take climate action in this sector to achieve the objectives of the Paris Climate Accord. Um, so, you know, the, the challenge here is, you know, how do you provide affordable, safe transportation and reduce carbon emissions that go with it? And, you know, one of the ways that we have done this is that we have partnered with a company called Enride, which is an electric transportation company, and Telia to create a all electric autonomous transportation system that is more safer and it's more sustainable. Um, so what that means is that, you know, by, by switching to an EV powered uh, solution that is powered by renewable energy, we can reduce carbon emissions in networks, in logistics networks by up to 90%. Um, and also, you know, the autonomous vehicles are driverless, obviously, and they're commercial and they're driverless. So that means that there's less downtime, there's more reliability. And so the total cost of ownership becomes low. And then because these EVs don't have any, uh, any tailpipe emissions, the air quality inside cities improves by, by a lot. And, and the role that 5G has in this is that connectivity is a key requirement for the autonomous vehicles uh, to be able to operate on, on streets. Um, you know, and the connectivity needs to be high speed, it needs to be low latency, and it needs to have increased reliability, um, which is what 5G provided. So, you know, that is why 5G has been the key enabler in this sustainable transport solution um, by providing the connectivity and the reliability that is required to put these safe, you know, EV autonomous vehicles onto public roads and allow, you know, the transportation sector really get the entire benefit from an economic standpoint, uh, but then also from an environmental standpoint. So, you know, this is just one of the many examples of how 5G is being used across the globe to have more sustainable solutions uh, and take climate action. It sounds very good, Bushan. Uh, I think with these words, we would like to thank you from Ericsson. Thank you for listening in to this section on 5G and uh, sustainability. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you so very much to our presenting sponsor, Ericsson. Uh, now, to those of you who just joined, welcome. This is the uh, Nordic Innovation Summit 2020. Now, we normally have the home of the beautiful National Nordic Museum. And uh, I'm here virtually, and this is about as close as any one of us is gonna get uh, today to within the halls of the lovely National Nordic Museum. It is such a fantastic home for this summit. But I would like you to join me and we'll do a virtual tour, a quick walkabout here to see the insides of the National Nordic Museum. Please join me. The National Nordic Museum was founded over 40 years ago as the Nordic Heritage Museum, a mostly volunteer effort housed in a surplus elementary school. Thanks to the love and hard work of hundreds of volunteers, the museum flourished as a center of Nordic culture in the Pacific Northwest, with a focus on the Nordic immigrant and Nordic American experience. Thanks to the generosity of its members and donors, the museum opened its doors to an extraordinary new home in 2018. With its iconic design and strategic location near the heart of Seattle's historic Nordic community, the museum has become a local, national, and international hub for all things Nordic. The first thing you see when you enter the museum is the spectacular Fjord Hall that runs the entire length of the building. Its stark white walls angled and twisting like a glacial crevasse. An enormous map, soaring almost 10 meters high, lets visitors trace their roots and envision the Nordic countries. The museum's permanent collection includes more than 80,000 individual pieces, many of which are part of the museum's core exhibition, Nordic Journeys, which examines the core Nordic values of openness, social justice, connection to nature, and innovation throughout 12,000 years of Nordic European and Nordic American history. One of the key themes of the museum is the Great Migration from the Nordic countries to North America. Driven by the search for a better life, one third of the entire population left the Nordic countries and made the difficult journey to the New World between 1840 and 1920. Beyond the exhibitions, the museum presents over 200 programs a year for visitors of all ages and backgrounds. 
Music from classical to folk to Nordic punk rock, films, lectures, youth camps, and a wide range of classes in Scandinavian languages, arts and crafts, and cooking. In recognition of the extraordinary breadth and depth of its offerings and its national and international importance, in 2019, the United States Congress and the President designated it the National Nordic Museum. The museum continues to expand its offerings and look for new ways to share Nordic culture and ideas with an even wider audience. The Nordic Innovation Summit does exactly that. Thank you, Robert. And uh, before we uh, go on to the rest of the program, just to remind those of you who just joined that we'd love to take questions and comments. And there's a good discussion going on on the YouTube uh, chat panel. And um, before I introduce our next guest, I also want to remind you that we have some fantastic panels coming up. We have From Brown to Green, where you'll get to listen to four thought leaders and action leaders when it comes to turning legacy business into new sustainable business and industries, in fact. And then finally, our health tech panel with uh, some of the world's foremost experts in that field. But for now, I'd like you to introduce, uh, I'd like you to meet, I'd like to introduce to you um, Tom Alberg, whom some of you met if you came to our conference last year. Tom is a Seattle icon. He's a co-founder of the Madrona Venture Group. He served on the boards of numerous public companies, including Amazon, um, whose board he served on since before that company went public in 1997. And Tom's a uh, third generation immigrant from Sweden. His grandfather came from a small town south of Östersund through Ellis Island in 1903 and uh, traveled to Western Washington, where he worked as a logger, eventually owning several shingle mills. So uh, Tom's roots grow deep and we value him a lot at the Nordic Museum. Take a look. I'm Tom Alberg, a managing director of Madrona Venture Group here in Seattle. This is Madrona's 25th anniversary, and over our first 25 years, we've invested in over 200 tech startups in the Pacific Northwest of the United States. Seattle, similar to Scandinavia, is a center of innovation. Microsoft and Amazon, two of the world's three most viable companies, are headquartered here. In addition to hundreds of new startups every year in Seattle, over 140 global technology companies have opened software engineering offices here, such as Apple, Facebook, and Google. In addition to companies such as Alibaba and Tencent, we would welcome Scandinavian tech companies to open software engineering offices here. I salute the Nordic Center. Not only does it have a wonderful uh, museum showing the cultural history of Scandinavia, but is also looking to the present and the future with this innovation conference. I look forward to more interactions between our regions. Maybe in the future, we can have not only telemedicine, but teleinvesting. Thank you. Teleinvesting, that's such a great lead off for our next year's event in my mind. What do you think, Robert? Yeah, I'd love to be in person, but we've got to bring ourselves here uh, in person as best as we possibly can. We absolutely do. Now, in last year's physical event, um, we were witnessing the signing of a memorandum of understanding between the government of Norway and the state of Washington about collaboration in the field of blue tech. And as much as we like to, to share, we measure ourselves partly by what gets done after we meet at the Nordic Innovation Summit. So we promised last year we'd look back in to see what actually happened uh, with uh, the projects that were part of this MOU. And to make sure we really dig in, we've asked uh, our own Todd Bishop from GeekWire up in Seattle to look into it on our behalf. Take a look. Good morning, everyone. Hello from Seattle. I'm Todd Bishop, editor and co-founder at GeekWire, the technology news site here in Seattle. And it's my pleasure to be joined on this, on this panel this morning by Jennifer State, the project director for Washington Maritime Blue, and Ken Husta, the Maritime Project Lead for Innovation Norway 
I got to cover the story last year at the Nordic Innovation Summit of the Memorandum of Understanding between Innovation Norway and the Washington State Department of Commerce. And I was struck that immediately we had a reader express skepticism about this MOU, uh, asking, what is the news here? So I thought I'd start with that because, Jennifer, in fact, there's been lots of news over the past year. Can you catch us up on what's been happening uh, as a result of this memorandum of understanding? Well, yeah, as, as you said, there's been uh, there's been a tremendous amount of activity between Washington and Norway in forming collaborations and partnerships. Um, Washington Maritime Blue is a cluster organization that was modeled in some degree to what's been happening in Norway with other maritime clusters. And there was another agreement with the NCE Maritime Clean Tech Cluster. So we have been um, collaborating with them and with this, uh, by going to Norway, Innovation Norway helped us organize a trip to Norway. And we took a Washington state delegation both in 2018 and 19. And uh, some of the pictures you're seeing are some of the visits that we had when we were in Norway. And the, the partnerships that have come out of that have been really amazing. Um, on, on the far left corner, you see us visiting an accelerator program, the Catapult Accelerator in Norway. Well, the Port of Seattle and Maritime Blue have now launched their first innovation accelerator program and graduated the first cohort of startup companies, uh, including some connections back to Norway. Uh, we Some of the partnerships that have formed are including some formal agreements between our company, DNVGL, and a new digital startup, IO Currents, uh, has happened where digital uh, they're using our digital platform and marketing on our platform called Veracity. Uh, and IO Currents, as this new startup actually happened to receive funding, word of their Series A funding while we were in Norway, so we were able to celebrate that together. Uh, and they also have a partnership they're on the cusp of announcing with a major Norwegian ship owner. So Seattle-based startup making these connections with Norwegian companies. And uh, as you know, DNVGL is a Norwegian-based company, uh, but we have about uh, uh, 80 staff in the Washington state area. We have directly benefited as well from this collaboration. Uh, we are doing quite a bit now with Washington state. We helped develop the strategy for the blue economy. Uh, and now uh, we are helping uh, operate the cluster organization. We're working with the Port of Seattle, both on helping start up the accelerator program and some clean energy planning. So we've had a lot of increased activity with our Norwegian company uh, in Seattle and the Washington state area uh, in a great deal having to do with the collaboration with Innovation Norway and uh, modeling a lot of what has happened in Norway and bringing that to Washington state. Yeah, it's fascinating to see this intersection of technology, clean tech, energy conservation, and the maritime industry. Ken, you're the maritime project lead for Innovation Norway. Explain your perspective on uh, this MOU and, and what's happened in the past year and, and what's ahead as well. Well, it, it's, been, uh, it's been actually a very exciting uh, three, four years uh, working with Washington State, uh, especially as an organization that works specifically with Norwegian uh, small to medium sized companies looking to grow internationally, uh, working with a state that has such a deep, deep Norwegian history to begin with, uh, and then work kind of collaboratively uh, as a win-win, uh, mutually beneficial to say the least, where we can bring uh, uh, some Washington state expertise to Norway and vice versa, because we, we do realize that as a country, we, we we don't know everything. We're not experts at everything, but we have started the process, especially with the electrification of ferries and the electrification of the maritime industry as a whole, bringing our experience uh, to Washington State uh, right now as they're going through their electrification of their Washington State ferries, uh, we thought was very relevant. And uh, working with the, uh, the uh, Department of Commerce, uh, we just realized after bringing some of the Norwegian technology companies to Washington State, they said, well, maybe we can bring a delegation to Norway and learn a little bit more about the cluster organizations, uh, how the companies work uh, together uh, versus against each other, even though they might be uh, doing the exact same technology. Uh, they can actually collaborate on certain projects versus uh, going against each other. So bringing some of that to Washington State, who was very open to learning more about what we've been doing and, and bringing them around, we, we thought was a win-win, which has now created um, 
some some success stories uh, from Norway to Washington State. So we're we're excited about how this has grown and and looking forward to uh, to seeing what's going to happen in the in the next year. Yeah, and we have along those lines, we have several joint innovation projects, as we call them, the, that are these collaborative uh, efforts that we are doing in Washington State now, modeled around uh, some of the joint innovation project ideas in Norway, and a lot of that is. As Ken said, electrification of vessels and working together with several different companies and organizations to help accelerate that innovation. Well, it's fascinating to see this connection between the Nordic countries and the Seattle region and Washington state continue in this new era. era. And uh, it's, it's going to be interesting to see what happens in, in the year ahead. Jennifer and Ken, thank you very much for talking with us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, enjoy the rest of the conference, everybody. Uh, until next time, I'm Todd Bishop from GeekWire, and have a great day. That is awesome. Seeing tangible action being taken and where the, the Nordic Innovation Summit is serving as a, as a platform for collaboration. That's absolutely true. Well, once again, we wouldn't be able to be here if it wasn't for the kind support of many of our sponsors. <clears throat> Excuse me. So here are all of them. Uh, we're going to show them all, and we say thank you so very much to each and every one of them. Um, right now, I'd like to highlight three sponsors in particular, beginning with our friends at Scan Design. Greetings. My name is Fidelma McGinn, and I'm pleased to be joining you today as the incoming president of Scan Design Foundation. With me is Mark Schleck, who is the outgoing president and a member of the board of directors of Scan Design Foundation. The Scan Design Foundation has been a longtime supporter of the National Nordic Museum. As a valued partner, the museum has helped us tremendously in carrying out our mission to foster Danish-American relations and we are proud to be a sponsor of this summit. So thank you for joining us and participating in this online edition of the Nordic Innovation Summit. We hope it'll act as a springboard to foster more dialogue around Nordic innovation and cooperation. Barbell. Hi, I am Bodil Stevens from Seattle Bank. As a boutique bank, we work with innovators, entrepreneurs, families, and community organizations. We are proud to support the efforts of the National Nordic Museum, bringing together communities here in Seattle and in the Nordic countries while helping recognize the innovators of the past and exchanging ideas with those who are innovating our future. Hello, my name is Lars Johnson. I am the founder and CEO of Stellar Holdings, a real estate investment and development company based here in Seattle, but with significant operation was also in Sweden, which is where I came from 35 years ago. During the 35 years I've been here in Seattle, I have seen a tremendous growth here and um, seen this provincial city growing from kind of a small city to be one of the leaders in the world in high-tech, uh, uh, biomed, and many other areas that represents the future. Of course, in a city that grows like we are doing and uh, needs to attract a lot of people, you need also real estate development that is innovative. And there are many challenges that you face with this kind of growth everything from nice attractive offices to retailing to um, places to live and of course communication and um, those challenges have been met innovatively in 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 uh, seattle stellar has been able to participate in a few of these areas we were part of the revitalization of the retail core in seattle in the mid 90s and now we are doing developments in areas where the public tra uh, transportation is now being built out. We are very happy to be part of the uh, Nordic Innovation Summit here this year as well as last year. And in spite of the coronavirus and the physical 
difficulties to come here, we do believe and are convinced this will be a successful event this year. And we in particular look forward to the event that will continue in October, which is the Urban Lab and the um, Smart City discussions that will take place and where I am sure there will be significant take and give between the Nordic countries and, uh, um, and the Seattle area. So very welcome to Seattle, then physically hopefully and now virtually. Thank you very much. All right. Now I have the privilege to present another key sponsor here, Nesta, uh, which is a fascinating company doing some very important sustainability work. Now, Nesta is often seen as a traditional oil company. So what does that have to do from going brown to green? Well, I think as you'll see from uh, uh, hearing from Nesta's U.S. President, Jeremy Baines, it has absolutely everything to do with going from brown to green. So please, let's hear from, from Jeremy. In early April, the smoggy skies of Los Angeles were amongst the clearest in the United States. At the same time, people in northern India could glimpse the Himalayas. Here in Houston, satellite imagery shows clear skies with significantly less nitrogen dioxide, carbon monoxide and other pollutants above our heads in Space City. Normally, this should be a cause for celebration, but not this year. The clear air is just a side effect of COVID-19, and most experts predict a quick return of smoggy, dirty air once the world's economy roars back to life, unless something changes. As the United States reopens for business, now is the time to put the fight against climate change and clear air at the center of our economic recovery. By getting this right, we can create a green recovery and a future where clear air and water are not just short-term silver linings of future natural disasters. Our economic recovery will see planes back in the sky, big trucks on the road, construction sites full of cranes and cement mixers, and farmers in their tractors. If we continue business as usual, most of those vehicles will run on diesel and jet fuel. The good news is the tools needed to create a green recovery and fight catastrophic climate change exist. Advanced biofuels like renewable diesel and sustainable aviation fuel can keep all these vehicles moving with a much smaller carbon footprint and less pollution. Take Neste My Renewable Diesel. It emits up to 80% less carbon dioxide and pollutants compared to fossil fuel. And it's made from used cooking oil, greases and rendered fats, not crude oil. On the horizon, a new wave of raw materials, from algae to forestry waste, to even converting atmospheric CO2 with renewable power to liquids. These could further reduce the carbon intensity of renewable diesel and other advanced biofuels. The best part? Renewable diesel and sustainable aviation fuel are drop-in. They work with existing engines and infrastructure. No expensive new infrastructure or engines are needed. At the most basic level, Neste is in the business of recycling, or rather, upcycling carbon. We turn the carbon molecules found in trash into renewable fuels. When these renewable fuels are used in engines, no new carbon is released into the atmosphere. This isn't science fiction. Renewable products made by Neste prevented more than 9.6 million tons of CO2 equivalent from entering the atmosphere in 2019. Our goal is to get that number up to 20 million tons by 2030. Advanced biofuels must play a larger role in America's transport system if we want a sustainable economic recovery and sustainable environment. Right now, there's a big push to electrify parts of the transport sector that are, by definition, hard to electrify. This narrow focus only preserves fossil fuels market share by ignoring existing successful solutions that work. Refiners know this and have been ramping up production of diesel and jet fuel. 
Fortunately, there are many good people who are continuing to champion clean air, clean water, and fight climate change. People like Washington's own Senators Carlisle and Lias, Chairman Fitzgibbon, Seattle Port Commission, and of course, Governor Inslee. And companies like Microsoft and Amazon have set bold climate change target. Thank you for your hard work. You are not alone. Neste stands beside you. Let's work faster, bolder, and together to rewrite the rules of the game. We can create a green recovery plan that places the fight against climate change at the core of our economic strategy. After all, we share the same goal, fighting climate change and creating a healthier planet for our children. Has transformed itself from an oil company to the world's third most sustainable company. What might be the lessons for, for other companies and, and what other companies and what other industries might be able to go through a similar transition? To explore this, we've assembled a great panel and as your guided moderator, the unstoppable Robert Strand. I'm excited to be joined by three esteemed panelists. We have Jeremy Baines, president of Nesta US, Conrad Bergstrom, the CEO and founder of Exshore, and John Downey, who's president for the Americas with Hertegruten. And welcome, gentlemen. It's a Thank real you. privilege to, to, to be with you here. Um, if I could, before I ask a few questions, though, I'd, I'd, I'd like to, if, if each of you would kindly offer just a, a, a brief uh, introduction to yourself and your respective organization. And Jeremy, if I could, I'd, I'd like to start with you, please. Thank you, Robert, and it's a real honor to participate in the From Brand to Green panel discussion today. Uh, my name is Jeremy Baines. I'm the president of Neste US, and I've had the pleasure of working for Neste for nearly 20 years now. Neste is the third most sustainable company in the world, and we are the leading producer of renewable diesel. It's, uh, Neste has had quite a transformation over the just over 70 years history that we've had starting off as a traditional oil refiner, but now in the last 15 years, 10 years, we have really transformed into a leader in the renewable space. Uh, to the point that just a couple of years ago, um, just until a couple of years ago, we were called Neste Oil, and we dropped the oil out of our brand name. We are now just Neste, liquid in Finnish. Um, and therefore, it's, it's a pleasure to participate in this panel today and uh, look forward to exchanging some interesting views with you all. That's great, Jeremy. Thank you so much. And Conrad, we'd love to hear. Please tell us just a little bit something about yourself and your, your wonderful organization. Yeah, uh, my name is Conrad Bergstrom. I'm the president and founder of Exshore. Uh, we make 100% electric boats. So we are about to change the whole marine industry. If you could imagine sailing without wind, getting out on the sea without fumes, without noise and vibrations to a fraction of the cost of driving a boat because the water uh, has a density 784 times the air. So driving anything in the water takes a lot of energy. So the savings are bigger with the, with the boat. We uh, are working with three pillows uh, for our brand and that's design, sustainability and technology. Uh, and we aim to become the car manufacturer within the marine industry. And right now the technology is quite expensive, but our mission is to scale and do volumes so we will become the people's boat. The people's boat, that's got some good resonance to it. Um, John, I'd like to turn to you. And I just have to say as a fellow American, it's, it's a privilege to be engaged with you here in, in discussions of the Nordics. Um, so please, uh, John Downey, please uh, tell us a little bit something about yourself and, and Hertha Gruden. Thanks, Robert. Um, I'm really excited to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, my name is John Downey. Uh, I'm the president for Hertzgruten Americas. Uh, and if you don't know, Hertzgruten is the world's largest uh, expedition cruise firm. Um, we are also the greenest cruise firm in the world. And uh, if you don't know much about expedition cruising, um, you have to kind of forget what you know about cruising in general. Um, 
we have custom expedition built uh, ships that focus on uh, traveling to the corners of the earth. Um, we're the leading provider in Antarctica uh, for expedition cruises down there, but we also sail over the top of Canada, north of, <clears throat> excuse me, north of Norway, um, down the Patagonian coast. And so we, for our 127 year history, have been the first to see the impacts of climate change in the Arctic and Antarctic waters. And uh, so we've decided um, over the last decade uh, to become the leading cruise provider uh, from a sustainability perspective. We're taking a number of measures across our entire fleet and all of our operations to uh, reduce the impact that we have on the environment. And eventually our goal is to become carbon neutral. Um, we have the world's first hybrid electric cruise ship. Um, it's the first of its kind. Uh, we actually have two of them now. We just launched our second one recently. Um, we are using biofuel uh, on the Norwegian coast. Uh, we're also incorporating liquid natural gas to reduce our emissions impact on the environment. And we're also making uh, changes to the operations, uh, operational side of our business um, to uh, reduce single-use plastic. We've actually eliminated it and we're the first cruise firm to do so in the world on board. Um, we also build in, uh, in the design of our ships, uh, a number of different measures to reduce our uh, fuel and, and electricity consumption over the course of our cruises. And so we're very, very proud of how we're contributing and leading in the sustainability uh, space from a cruise perspective. Uh, very excited to be here. Thank you. Thank you, John. And I'd actually like to, to, to come back uh, right to you if I could with the, with the first question. And I should say, first off, um, I had the privilege to live in Norway for a year as a Fulbright scholar and uh, am a big fan of, of Hurtigruten and I very much enjoyed it. Um, and so if I could start with you here and just you, you offer just a, a, a glimpse of the Hurt and Gruten story. Um, what's some guidance that you have uh, based upon your experiences with Hurt and Gruten and the experiences of Hurt and Gruten as large in trying to go from brown to green? Yeah, um, so we uh, we've taken the approach that there are a multitude of technologies uh, to solve the sustainability problem. There's no one silver bullet to fixing this, this situation. And uh, we're, um, we have chosen to lead the way in the cruise industry. If you rewind a couple of years ago, uh, every other cruise firm said it was impossible to do a hybrid electric ship. It didn't exist. Obviously automobiles existed in that front, but, uh, but scaling up that type of technology and operations seemed impossible to the cruise industry at the time. We've chosen to innovate and actually take the lead ourselves instead of following. Um, and we've done that across our entire uh, fleet as we've incorporated things like biofuels in and uh, liquid natural gas. And we're choosing to make, take every possible step available to us and innovate where technology doesn't exist so that we can actually lead the industry. Many others are choosing to follow or not follow at all. Uh, they're blaming lack of infrastructure instead of taking the lead to develop that infrastructure. Last year we did uh, the world's largest biofuels contract uh, in the world. Um, and we chose to do that because we wanted to make sure the infrastructure was available on the Norwegian coast to, uh, to support our ships. Um, so it's, it is about taking a stand and setting, uh, setting a flag of where you need to get to in the next couple of years and then continually moving that flag forward. And it's one of the reasons why I'm so incredibly proud to work for Hertzgruten uh, as a company, because we do believe this is important. It's both right for the world, but it's also uh, it's also right for business. And uh, and we get that now, and we're going to continue innovating in the future. John, thank you for that. And I think that that it, it serves Jeremy, if we could look to you and, and Nesta and, and your story. Uh, perhaps there are some parallels with some things that, that, that John has said here. And please, could you offer a bit of of guidance, perhaps some lessons from the Nesta story on going from brown to green. Yes, uh, with with pleasure. And I think one thing that uh, John mentioned really resonates with me is is that uh, the aspect that there is no one solution uh, to, to to climate change. And 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 to me, it's an indication that we will go to a polyfuel world where there are lots of different technologies and lots of different fuels available uh, to reduce carbon emissions. And that's that's one of the things that uh, Neste throughout its history has been doing. I mean, Neste being a Finnish company, uh, Nordic company, we've always been very conscious about 
uh, our place in society and our place in the environment. We've always looked at developing cleaner, higher performing fuels. And that's what led us really to this renewable diesel technology. Using waste cooking oils, uh, greases, animal fats, really from this brown to the green. So from the, the brown greases and real wastes to the, the green, renewable, green swan, if you want, of the industry. And, and I think that's, for, for me, that's the exciting part is that we, that we find ways of reusing the carbon that is in the atmosphere rather than pumping carbon out of the ground and then burning it and adding it to the atmosphere. Yeah. Um, so, so really we, we've on this journey of developing new and more sustainable fuels. And, um, the other thing that, that I think resonates with me is what John was saying is that the excuse. A lot of companies want to have an excuse not to do something. Yeah, but this technology exists today. Renewable fuels exist today, not only to power your, your cars, but it also a sustainable aviation fuel to power your planes. It exists for vessels. So the technology is there. It's just a choice whether you want to burn something sustainable or you'd want to continue to burn fossil fuels. So really excited to, to, to learn more about uh, John's journey with Hüfte Gluten. That's great. And that brings us, uh, Conrad, to you. And, uh, you know, it, it might seem that Xshore, perhaps you have a little bit of a different story here as a company that started foundationally, arguably green. Uh, so could you offer some of your personal reflections on, on, on going green and any guidance that you may have for others? Sure. Um, I do believe that there will not be any sustainable, um, non, uh, I don't believe that any company who's not sustainable will survive and it's going to go quick. Uh, so everybody has to do this transaction. Um, I was just lucky that I could start a new company and, and go green directly in, to make this change. But of course, there is challenges also being new that the whole environment um, is not really ready. There is a lot of materials that is not sustainable that we have to use from a, a security perspective and safety. Uh, but there is so much uh, new uh, products coming to, uh, to the better. So, for example, we use cork material instead of uh, teak or plastics uh, on, on, the, on the decking. Now, it goes without saying, the world has changed uh, in very short order. Um, and I'd like to ask each of you, uh, and, and John, if I could start with, with, with you again here, um, what does this mean for your commitment to sustainability? So, John, what does it mean for Hurt Gruten's commitment to sustainability uh, facing the crisis that we're all part of today? Yeah, great question. Um, we, uh, so I don't think it changes, it doesn't uh, detract from the kind of our focus on sustainability and if anything, it pushes us forward. Um, while it, it does seem dire right now, uh, we are looking to the future. We're excited about um, restarting operations uh, both along the Norwegian coast and, and other locations around the world. and. If anything, it means we're going to double down on our focus on sustainability. Um, uh, people are looking to get outside. Uh, they are looking to experience the world again. And we think have, we have a huge opportunity to show them uh, not just um, these different parts of the world that are, that are very difficult to get to um, without, uh, without adventure cruise operations, but also um, do it in a way that educates them on, uh, on, on what's going on in the polar uh, caps and, and how climate change is affecting, uh, affecting the world. And we want to do it in a way that uh, both makes us proud, it educates the customer or the guest, and also uh, it convinces them to push further in making changes for, uh, for climate responsibility. And Jeremy, from a Nesta perspective, uh, how would you respond? Well, um, yes, we are tackling the COVID-19 crisis at the moment, but the, in, the climate change crisis has not gone away. Yesterday, for, for, one, for, for once in a very long time, uh, smog and, uh, has, has been blown away and we've got clean airs in large parts of the world. But 
that is unfortunately not going to stay once the economy starts roaring back. So, so we really have a choice to make at this point. Do we want to go back to business as usual and boom and bust cycles, or do we want to have not only a sustainable recovery of the economy, but also to have a more sustainable way of powering our future? And I, um, I, th I think there's there's more there's more choices to be made. I mean, personally, I drive an electric car. I need to drive 4.2 miles to get to work. So that works very easily. Um, I run, uh, the, the house runs on uh, green wind energy. So that, that is, that is a sta sustainable choice. But you have millions of heavy duty trucks on the road. And it's just not good enough to say that, oh, well, one day, maybe they can be electrified. They, these trucks are going to run for decades to come. We need to find a way of fueling them in a renewable and sustainable manner. And that technology exists today. There are biofuels out there. There's biodiesel, there's like uh, fuels like Neste produces, renewable diesel, that can reduce the emissions by up to 80% overnight. The only thing that you need to do is change the fuel. And the same thing goes for planes and the same thing goes for boats. That exists. And now is really the time to make those choices. And Conrad, looking to you, in the face of the current crisis, what does this mean uh, for Fshar? Well, um, I do believe that uh, it's not only bad; uh, it's also time to reflect. Uh, to to uh, you know, um, when when you work very hard, it, it, sometimes you need some time to to actually come back and and be in nature and 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 do all that. So that has actually been a really good thing for me personally. Uh, for Fshar. Uh, we see that more and more, we have three different segments. One is business to consumers, and they are uh, making more green choices, and that is where we drive the trend. Then we have uh, the business to business, which is like tax, water taxes, uh, hotels, and so on, that want to show the sustainable way, and, and, and that they are aware and want to be on this trip to make the change so we all can survive. And then we have the business to governments. So we actually have increased our business since this happened. And, and um, I just pray for all the ones that uh, having a business that, uh, you know, um, haven't been able to, to, to uh, uh, go through this because many have worked their whole life. This is not some financial guys fucked up. This is, you know, something that is really hitting all kind of places in, in, in the society. So uh, we, we need to come together and help each other to, to get through this. But when we come out on the other side, I believe that we will be stronger and that we need to be more sustainable, everyone. And John, I, I'd like to look to you again here because of course this is the Nordic Innovation Summit. Uh, and uh, as an American, I've drawn a lot of inspiration by looking at the Nordics and, and having experiences over the last almost two decades of comparisons between the, the Nordic context and the U.S. context. And I would be very interested to hear your reflections on any differences, similarities that you see uh, from your experiences in the U.S. and the Nordics, and specifically as it relates to ideas of innovation and sustainability, if you would. Absolutely. Um you know, it's it's interesting. Uh, this is the first Norwegian company I've worked for. Um, but if you look at not just Norwegians, but Scandinavians and Scandinavians in general, they have been the first to experience the effects of climate change. Uh, Norway, um, if you're not familiar, set up the Seed Vault, um, which is a seed repository in a territory called Svalbard, and it's inside the Arctic Circle, but it's part of Norway, and it's it's uh, very far north. And uh, that was planning ahead. They, they knew this was coming. There, there, it was very obvious that we're going to be in a bad situation uh, this century. And uh, ironically enough, the sea vault actually flooded recently because uh, climate change is accelerating faster than everyone expected. Um, but we're starting to see the same types of, types of things in, in the U.S. In Washington state, the glaciers on Rainier have receded at a monumental rate over the last 20 years. And, um, and so I think people in the U.S. are starting to appreciate uh, the gravity of, of what's happening a little bit more. But um, I've 
working for the Norwegians has served in, in, as an inspiration. Um, and we are the first, we have been the first cruise line to see the impact of our actions uh, in, in the Arctic waters. Um, and that's part of the reason why we lead the way we do in, in sustainability. And for us, it is 100% about making the right choices for the world. As Jeremy had mentioned, um, they're from a fuel perspective, uh, we have chosen to take a higher cost fuel across our fleet. And we did that a decade ago. Every other cruise line and shipping line in the world can make that decision, but they've chosen not to because of cost. And so uh, it, it's the Norwegians have, have really incorporated their experience from a climate change perspective and may take an active decision making to get us to the right place, at least where we can contribute to sustainability. That's great. Uh, John and, and uh, Jeremy, might you have any reflections on on, on your perspectives of what what this what a, a Nordic innovation approach, a Nordic approach to sustainability, uh, what that means? Well, I can give you a practical example of what uh, what Nesta is doing. So, not a, uh, last year uh, in 2019, we helped our customers reduce CO2 emissions by 9.6 million tons. That that that's that's a concrete result. Uh, Neste as a company has not only um, committed to moving ahead in decarbonizing faster than regulation in Europe, but also we've set ourselves the ambitious target of being uh, carbon neutral by 2035 across all of our businesses. So imagining that today we still have two fossil refineries, we want to get to carbon neutral by 2035. That is a huge commitment. And I think, and I honestly believe that is, that is something that Neste can achieve. So if we can do that and we can in, continue to increase the amount of renewable products that we can bring to our customers to help reduce carbon, yes, we can do this as a society, but it is a choice that we need to have. And that's why I think, again, when, when, uh, when we're fighting our way out of this crisis, this is also the time to have a clear policy that our, that, our, that our politicians, that our governments, federal, state, local, that they start working and deciding what kind of future do we want to have. They are, there are some very good policies out there. Uh, California has a low carbon fuel standard. Oregon has a clean fuel program. Washington uh, state has, has been um, voting to implement a program such as that as well. So I think the, the opportunity is there for sustainable, clean recovery. And Jeremy, I think that you're hitting at a point here when we talk about innovation, it's so important to include, and that's innovations in policy. And that's getting smart policy. And I would suggest that we could draw a lot of inspiration from a Nordic context also with respect to this and examples in the world um, about smart policy. And perhaps that's how we need to frame it also, rather than talking about, particularly in an American context, talking about regulation, which is inherently seen as bad, smart policy. And it seems that you offer some really good examples of smart policy that we could drive. Conrad, we have just a moment left in our panel. Do you have any parting words of wisdom that you could share with us very briefly? Well, you should remember that it's uh, the decision makers, and in this case for the companies, the customers, who will decide what to buy. And uh, they are definitely not going to shoot themselves in the foot. They are going to go sustainable because that is the future. We all have to do that. Excellent words to conclude by here, Conrad. Uh, I, it's such a privilege, uh, Jeremy, Conrad, John, to be able to learn from you from your experiences and the experiences of your respective organizations on going from brown to green. Thank you so very much uh, for sharing your insights. Thanks, Thank you. Everyone. Thank you. Thank you. What a great panel. And we're talking about sailing without wind. That's actually a, that's a Swedish lullaby my dad used to sing for me when I was a kid. It goes, it goes like this. Vem kan segla förutom vind? Vem kan ro utan oror? That's the next trick for next year, to row without oars, Robert. Well, uh, uh, Vigor, it was so lovely, but I, I feel, fear that we're going to put people to sleep uh, with, with your lovely lullaby there. <laughs> so let's not do that, though, and, and I guarantee we won't because we've got uh, the, the chance to be joined by uh, John Downey of Herzogutten for a question that comes from you all. Um, and so let me read this here. One of the questions that was sourced here, 
Um, and that just to emphasize here, please do pose your questions and your comments uh, on the chat features for wherever you are joining us. And John, if I could, uh, hi, John. Hi, hey, Robert. Great to talk with you again. All right, great to hear from you, John. And 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 here's a question that it's 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 specific to Hertzgruden and beyond. And I'm sure many will be interested to hear your response to this, John. Um, the the comment question is that sustainable and green choices have historically often been more expensive to me as a consumer or a business owner. So when can I expect the sustainable choice to be the most economical choice? And also, when could it be the most economical choice? at the point of investment as well as purchase. Uh, will I always be forced to pay a premium for sustainability is the question. John, how do you respond to that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think it's a combination of things and I think it starts with the, the operators and suppliers first um, in making a decision to do what's right for the environment for the world long term. Um, a good example to use here is uh, marine gas oil. So most of the cruise and shipping industry uses uh, uh, fuel oil, uh, heavy fuel oil, which is a less refined version uh, um, of diesel. And by doing that, they, they cite the, re the reasoning they cite for not using it is because it's a higher cost. Um, and uh, that ultimately is a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you keep saying that and don't use it, uh, you don't create the demand that will drive the cost structure down for, for that particular uh, that good. And so um, we made the decision early on, but we need to be joined by a lot of other suppliers and operators to take a stand to make that shift. And as more operators uh, and shippers start using marine gas oil, the cost structure will obviously drop and that will should be passed along to the consumer at the end of the day. Um, but it, it, someone has to take the stand first um, and, and drive the change that is necessary for the industry and the world to change uh, along with it. Um, I, it. I think what we're going to see over the next uh, five to 10 years is the technologies will evolve um, that will improve cost structure for the end consumer and for the operator. Um, the the technologies are going to change uh, right now as uh, as operators switch over to things like liquid natural gas uh, or in our case a, a hybrid electric approach um, it allows us to keep that cost structure down um, in the in the near term but then as we uh, build out new technologies uh, that that kind of will shift as, as we go along um, so I think uh, what people should expect is that operators um, operators will start driving towards this going forward. Uh, and the ultimate uh, goal is to get to something that has less of an impact on the environment without uh, without incurring extra costs for the end consumer, because that's ultimately what's going to drive the um, uh, the demand uh, for, for both shipping and crews. Well, John, thank you so much for those words. And I heard in there that there needs leadership. Someone must move. And I think that we're joined by so many folks, the Nordics, as the leaders, to take those first steps and to prove the proof of concept, and others will follow. Um, with that, Bigger, I'm going to toss it back to you. Yeah, thanks, John, and thanks for leading Hurti Uh Hopefully, once the world opens up, you'll have a lot of passengers on your ships again. Now, this summit and the museum would not exist if not for the great support we've had along the way from all the five Nordic governments and, uh, and their representatives in, in the States as well, their consulates, their embassies, and, and also the Nordic Innovation House. Um, we're going to hear now from the two representatives we have not heard from yet, from Denmark and Iceland. Take it away. Greetings to you all. Innovation has never been more important than now. And I applaud the Nordic Museum, which I do hope I will be able to visit soon, for going ahead with this important event in the shadow of the pandemic. The government of Iceland recognized the importance of innovation in its substantial economic recovery package, including incentives and support for the innovation sector. My hope is that when we finally have this crisis behind us, we will return back to our lives, set on working together for a more sustainable, environmentally friendly world for us all. We should not forego of this opportunity for change. Let's keep the skies blue and the air clean 
post-COVID. And for that, we need the power of innovation and investment in innovative ideas, technology and solutions for the future of our planet. I wish you all an interesting summit, hopefully producing some concrete ideas for all our sakes. Thank you. Hello and good morning to all of you. As the Danish ambassador to the US, I'm pleased that this Nordic Innovation Summit can take place despite the, despite the difficult circumstances that we are all living under where travels and uh, large gatherings have been shut down. A huge thanks to the National Nordic Museum and to the uh, sponsors of the summit for making the event possible. Fortunately, uh, good ideas and collaboration cannot be shut down. In difficult times like this is really a time for ideas and for forging partnership uh, for a more sustainable world, for innovative and green uh, solutions. Today, Denmark is known as a front runner for green solutions. But that creativity actually came uh, from a place of need. Um, the Danish transition towards green economy uh, began in, in the 1970s uh, with the oil crisis. And now after decades of development and political prioritization, um, we are known as front runners when it comes to green solutions. But the challenges today are even bigger. We have to address climate change with the same determination as the pandemic. We have to cooperate, to share experiences and find new uh, sustainable solutions. And this is really what this summit is all about, the way I see it. I would therefore like to thank once again uh, the hosts and the sponsors for making it happen. I would like to thank you all for participating uh, virtually. I wish you a great and creative summit. Thank you. Thanks again to our Nordic governments for their support for the museum and for this conference. The role of governments in innovation and both as regulators and as supporters has been a subject of some dispute and perhaps with, with the dividing line going through the Atlantic for some, some time. The, C19, the COVID-19 situation has probably accentuated this and at the same time some of the, some of the big, biggest companies on the planet have uh, have seen this as an opportunity to to do a lot of good for for society and to some extent we're here today thanks to that our next keynote speaker has a unique perspective on this and, and many other issues he's a native finn he's a silicon valley based tech ceo he's a veteran of the open source movement and now most recently he's a white hat hacker so please welcome martin mikos the ceo of hacker one Thank you, Birger. Uh, thank you, Robert. Thanks for this amazing event. It's fantastic to be here today. <clears throat> uh, my name is Martin Mikos. I'm the CEO of HackerOne in San Francisco today, uh, eagerly connecting with all of you online. And the topic of today is the role of tech in society or the role of society in tech, which used to be not an issue at all because tech did its uh, own stuff and society did its own stuff. But today, with software taking over everything in the world and everything being based on the digital world, suddenly the role of tech is uh, intermingled with the role of society. And we have to figure out how to make them work together because they are not separate any longer. And two other things that are separate is the Nordics and the U.S. West Coast. I grew up in Scandinavia. I feel like... Uh, a true Nordic citizen, and at the same time, I feel very much at home in uh, California and on the, the U.S. West Coast. And we sometimes say here that when we compare and contrast the two cultures, because both cultures, both the Nordic culture and the one we find here on the West Coast, have the ingredients, ingredients for a wonderful society of the future, but neither has really achieved it yet, but the ingredients are there. And maybe the, the most, the starkest contrast is that when we say that in the Nordics, a million is a lot of money 
Uh, but in America, an hour is a long time. And every time when I deal with uh, Nordics or with people here, that's the difference. It's the difference of how they view time and what is the most scarce resource. In the Nordics, we always do it the frugal way. We always save money. We never tip much. We never overpay. We make sure it's all very economical. And in on the U.S. West Coast, when we build tech companies and otherwise, the only thing that that we can't get back is time. You can get back lost money. You can get back lost resources, lost opportunities, but lost time will never come back. So there's a distinction there in mindset, which creates a very uh, compelling, contrasting and complement of two cultures that look at things differently and achieve amazing things in their own rights, but in different ways. And when we then think about what where we are today with tech and society, uh, we often speak both in the Nordics and here about the need to keep regulation down, that regulation is bad and regulation will stifle innovation or stifle business. But I would claim that the, the fact that software is eating the world, as it were, is now causing us to be forced to regulating and building our principles for society into legislation that uh, that guides how software works because we have to make sure that the collective interests are taken care of while privacy is protected we have to allow cloud vendors and social media companies to collect data but we cannot let them abuse the the data they own data may be the new oil of the industry, but it's also the plutonium. It can be very toxic in the wrong place. So I say that if our lives are governed by algorithms, then algorithms must be governed by law. Uh, again, an old Norse tradition, we always said that land and our nation must be build on, built on law. That is the way you build a society. And I think we've come to a time where uh, we have to regulate how algorithms work. We should not regulate business. To build a business should be free, as in free capitalism, and, and companies should fight it out between each other. But the algorithms are not business. They affect our daily lives and the, the nature of our Western liberal democracy. So we have to protect it through, through law. And when we discuss this, many times we claim that there's a, a challenge in, in getting the interest of the individual matched with the interest of the collective or the interest of the capitalist matched with the interest of the employee. Or we say that there's a conflict between short-term goals and long-term goals. I don't believe in any of those conflicts, essentially. I think if there's a conflict, it be, it's because of greed and myopic self-interest. And the longer view you take, the easier it is to bridge those differences. So the longer the view, the less at odds are the interest of the individual and the interest of the collective. So when we now look at uh, privacy, the GDPR legislation, and we say, what's right and what's wrong here? If we try to solve it for today, we may have a conflict. If we say, what we would like society to be 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 100 years from now, suddenly we will realize that we have more in common than we have opposing each other, and we will figure out how to solve it. And that is the way to solve those difficult societal problems. Now, coming back to what we do here on the U.S. West Coast, we act very quickly, so we don't always take the long-term view. And this is where the Nordics can teach us a, a long-term horizon and the foregoing of some immediate benefit that is just a, a short-term temporary benefit in the interest of the long-term benefit. And, and I would like to round up with a principle that I learned back in Finland and in Scandinavia when I lived there, where we essentially say that when everyone is doing fine, everyone is actually doing better. And the meaning here is that we are all in the same pool. We're all in the same swimming pool. It's the same water for everybody, wherever you are. We have just one planet. And when we, when we who have resources or who are strong or who are capable for the moment, when we support those who are not and we make sure everybody is fine, then actually we make sure that everybody is better because it benefits ourselves as well. And with that, applying that principle, you can institute 
corporate social responsibility without harming the uh, very practical goals of capitalism and profit making. You can do both and you can still be a responsible citizen. And I think that is something we have to define now in the digital world. And in a way, at our company, we hack computer systems, but I actually call out to all of you to hack society. We have to hack we have to hack society for good now. We have to figure out a new way to define it because COVID is pushing us into the digital world faster than we could ever have imagined. And we need to figure out the rules of the game there. And they have to be legislated into strict rulings that nations and governments will agree on. So with that, thank you from uh, San Francisco. It's a wonderful event. I really enjoy the, the morning keynotes to talk about sustainability, humility, honesty, uh, innovation. Those are all topics uh, close to my heart. So over to you, Bidio. Thank you, Morten. What an inspiring keynote you've given us today. I, I want to start out with one question for you myself. Um, so I, I sense that you have a lot of passion around this balance between collaboration and competition, between uh, a zero-sum game and a joint tar pursuit of a joint target type of game. Um, and, uh, I'm wondering, in your personal work in the kind of crucible of capitalism, how, how have you managed to, and how have you tried to, to make this balance come alive in, in your companies? I, I, thanks for asking. I've been thinking about it a lot, and I finally felt good when I realized it's not a balance. Balance is the wrong word. It's a contrast. <laughs> like, yeah, if I put salt and sugar in food I'm preparing, I'm not trying the sugar, making the sugars feel salty or the salt be sweet. I will let them drive their own interests in the food, and it's more delicious with both of them present. And it's the contrast that can be can be delivering that thing. So a lot of times we think something needs to be sort of watered down into a compromise and consensus, and we should allow for the contrast. And that is what I've learned in the, on the US West Coast, where there's such diversity, plurality, so many different things, and people just readily accept that everything is different, and it is in the contrast of the different things that we get the great, the great results. And I'm thinking if it applies to human beings, it must apply more broadly. And that's how I can bridge the gap with things that seem so difficult to bridge. And I realize those who are opposed to it, they're just greedy. They're just lazy or greedy or not realizing that they're shooting themselves in the foot by asking for an immediate favor when they should make sure that they get a good future. So it's a false choice. You actually have to do both because that's how you get that, that great blend that has a contrast. That's my belief. I could be wrong, but that's my conviction. Thank you. I think an audience question here is a little bit along the same line. How, how could we apply the cooperation between Nordic companies and the governments and, and science establishment here in the US? It's a good question. I think the US might already be doing it. I, I think what I've seen, I haven't seen all of US, I've mostly seen California, but I see a very good collaboration between academia and business in the US, and I even see academia and government. I, I do think for all its weaknesses, the, the governance model of the United States is flexible and people, you see the same people straddle uh, those sides and ac academic people go into government and government people come into academia. So I, I think it's it's in pretty good shape, actually. I, I'm not sure what I would, would improve there. Um, I'm sure there's stuff to improve, but I, I I don't have a concrete idea. It, it sounds like you're very fundamentally an optimist, present conditions notwithstanding. Uh, I think it's the only way to live. Yes, I do. But, but I am a paranoid optimist. I'm, I, I force myself to face the hardest and harshest scenarios. And I'm a big fan of this uh, concept called the Stockdale Paradox. And I urge you to read about it where, like now in COVID, you have to be considering how bad it truly can get. And although we talk about innovation and sustainability here, we have human beings dying around us now in COVID-19. So, so we, we mustn't stay away from it. We mustn't become Pollyannish and, and be just optimistic. There has to be a, a grounding in reality. 
but but when you are there, then you realize that the only way to conduct life, and if you believe in in free will, then you you are an optimist. I think. Thank you, Morton. Thank you for a great keynote, and look forward to seeing you in the flesh in uh, next year's Innovation Summit. Thank you. And um, with that, I'm going to turn the word over to my incorrigible co-host, Robert Strand. I, uh, Martin, I, uh, those offerings were just fascinating. And I also want to say we need you over at the University of California, Berkeley also. And, and to continue these conversations, you're highlighting a different kind of capitalism. We're trying to build a different kind of capitalism. And you mentioned greed, rampant self-interest, some things that we're trying to fight against. I would suggest that this is something that in a Nordic context, the idea of stewardship is something that is much more pervasive. And what we need to do, and this is where I think that many of us in the US can draw inspiration from the Nordic context, is to move from the idea of an extractive view of the firm. How do I extract as much profit out of it as I can to a more stewardship? approach. And that gets us into that longer term view that is so when we talk about definition of sustainability, development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs, that long term view is inherently in there. Oh, there's so much good stuff that you had to offer here. And, and uh, so we'll continue the conversations. And that's what the Nordic Innovation Summit can help us do is foster these conversations and to continue them. Uh, now it is my privilege to have the opportunity to uh, share with you the distinguished Linda hofsted Helleland, the Minister of Regional Development of Digitization with Norway. Dear Nordic Innovation Summit, thank you to the organizers for conducting the third Nordic Innovation Summit this year virtually. I'm happy to be a part of this. The relationship between the United States and Norway is strong so are the ties to the state of Washington. The overall state of digitalization in Norway 2020 is solid. Norwegian society is built on fundamental values such as human rights and right to privacy. These are values we must ensure when embracing new technologies. We are open to testing new solutions and works within public-private partnerships. We see new technology as a driver for innovation, growth and modernization of our society. Together with the Nordic countries, we top the European Commission's Digital Index of 2019. We have a strong foundation in our nationwide digital infrastructure. Fast and reliable connectivity, access to data and artificial intelligence is vital to develop and optimize businesses. And as you know, all know, all businesses are now tech businesses. In Norway, we have many examples of this. Fish farms now depend on 5G networks and artificial intelligence to grow their businesses. We have also allocated our very own fjord to test autonomous ships for the industry. The data center business is also growing and Norway is well positioned to take our share of this growth. We have scalable, cost-efficient, renewable energy as well as reliable digital infrastructure. And we welcome, amongst others, Microsoft's two data centers in Oslo and Stavanger. Another example is how Volkswagen is running its most demanding high processing computing crash tests in a green mountain data center placed in an old mine in Rukan. Rukan, which is the cradle of Norwegian hydropower industry, with roots going back more than 100 years when Norway took a significant bet on the hydropower industry. This innovation from so many years back has served Norway well ever since. 
Earlier this year, we launched a Norwegian strategy for artificial intelligence. An example of how the government is taking responsibility and leading the way in our digital transformation. Right now, we are working on a white paper on how to stimulate for the data-driven economy and how to further strengthen the digital infrastructure. So, how is this accelerated digitalization helping us deal with the COVID-19 crisis right now? All countries need to find the right balance between health issues and the economy. For the economy, free and rules-based trade is essential. We are in this together. And this pandemic is challenging for all of us, but also creates opportunities for innovation, new sustainable solutions, and the reinforcing of process, processes already underway. Our response has been data-driven, leveraging a high degree of home digital access for work from home and homeschooling. Although Norway was a highly digitalized country even before the outbreak, we have in the last couple of months witnessed a rapid increase in the use of digitalized services. You could say Norway has been expressed digitalized. It will be interesting to see how much of this development we will be able to keep going post-COVID-19. The speed of innovation we are seeing in health tech is inspiring. And both Nordic and US companies has a lot to bring to the table here. Some examples are the national tracing app, Smittestop, and tools for remote doctor-patient consultations. Our Norwegian data registers are also of huge value in the IA health research. Now the question is, where do we go from here? I am sure businesses are able to adapt to new realities. The motivation is high for working out new solutions in these unprecedented times. This pandemic has shown that we are able to do more work from home and how digital infrastructure is essential for our society to function. The increasing rates of video conferencing, Netflix and other streaming platforms and the immense load of online working from home is driving more investment in the data-driven industry. The MOU between Innovation Norway and the state of Washington is a great example of our vast cooperation and common interests such as the oceans and their potential. I am confident that together we are able to accelerate the technology and innovation needed to work through this crisis and move forward. A big thank you to the organizers for conducting the Nordic Innovation Summit virtually this year. It's more important than ever that we get together and work together. And next year, I hope we are able to meet in person. Thank you. All right, and thank you very much to our distinguished colleague. And Bjerga, I'm going to turn it right over to you. Thanks, Robert. So healthcare and the uh, innovation and ev evolution of healthcare is clearly one of the key drivers for sustainable development. So when we wanted to make this year's conference about sustainability, it was clear to us we wanted to have a panel covering healthcare and innovation in that sector. We managed to assemble a stellar one, and uh, Andrew Trister, who is the Deputy Director of Digital Health Innovation at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, is here to lead it. Take a look. Great, thank you. Good morning and good evening. I am Andrew Trister, the Deputy Director for Digital Health Innovation at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. I'm really pleased to be here with this distinguished panel to discuss Nordic innovation in the context of health. There's likely no better time to be discussing this than now, as we see, we've shifted this meeting to be online and remote, given the exigency around COVID-19, and so much around digital and health have come into such stark relief for all of us around the world. At the Foundation, we've been focused on enabling better care delivery for those of the least in the world. We see a combination of ubiquitous tools like smartphones, AI, software, and attached hardware platforms as being critical to this mission. 
I'm really pleased to be here with Philip, Ollie, and Andreas from Koala Life, Cordy, and Igros. Over the next half hour, we'll speak about ways that their Nordic backgrounds inform their innovations, how they've approached the problem space around better measurements in the home, improving interface between patients and their physicians, and driving adoption of better protocols in the hospitals with technologies. I'll first ask each panelist to introduce themselves and their companies in a few minutes, and then we can get into the discussion. Maybe we can begin with Philip. All right, good morning and good evening. I am Philip Seiberg. I am uh, I'm Swedish and I am one of the founders of Koala Life. Um, it's a medical device company active in the cardiovascular and respiratory monitoring world. Uh, I am right now heading up the expansion in the US, so I'm based in Southern California. And what we developed and have on the market is a digital monitoring solution based on a device, algorithms, and engagement for the patient. So, so the patient is prescribed with this koala. Um, the patient typically holds it 30 seconds to the chest and it captures ECG and heart sounds, which are instantly in real time analyzed and available to prescribing physicians. And we just recently also expanded the use of this to be able to listen to lung sounds on the back. So if you're a COVID diagnosed patient, you can send your lung data to your prescribing physician. All right, thanks. Great, thank you. And now uh, let's move to Ali. Hello, good morning, good evening. I'm a surgeon from Sweden. A surgery is a very big part of medicine today with about 300 million operations done annually around the world according to the World Health Organization. Now surgery is also dangerous. 75 million of those patients are gonna suffer a complication and many times completely unnecessarily. Although we've had some fantastic innovations technically with nowadays robotic surgery in many cases, we seem to have forgotten some parts of the care of the surgical patient that is equally important. And that is how we get the patient to recover, to be able to eat, to be able to get out of bed, and to be able to do those things without pain and go home and feeling fine. Now we started looking at recovery uh, many years ago and started a society and a project called ERAS. That's short for Enhanced Recovery After Surgery. And we got the best people in the world to put together a guideline for us to tell us what we should be doing. They came up with about 20 different care elements that all have an impact on outcome. And together, they're equally important to the surgery itself. We then started a software company, Encare, uh, that have put these guidelines into a software that is readily available as a cloud uh, system. This allows units around the world to check their processes and their outcomes with the guidelines so that they can get full control over what they're doing all the time. Now this has been proven to be extremely effective. And we have now medical reports from all over the world showing that when you're using ERAS, you can reduce complications by up to 50%. You can have patients recover without going to intensive care to the same extent. And many of them will be going home feeling fine after days instead of weeks in the hospital. And recent data also shows that there's an association between enhanced recovery protocols and survival after cancer surgery. So uh, this is now available in, in uh, more than 25 countries around the world. And we have some of the leading centers in these countries helping us spread it further. We're looking for others to help us spread this so that we can reach just about everybody out there. Now we believe that the key to success is having the best innovators in the medical profession and the software profession come together and put together a device and a system that is so easy to use that it's gonna be used everywhere and we're just about being there. We just need to spread it. And in these days of COVID-19, with a huge backlog of surgery that never could be performed, and that is just queuing up to get done, and with enormous pressure on the intensive care beds around the world, we think that ERS is more needed than ever before. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And now, uh, Andreas. Thank you, um, calling in here from Copenhagen. Uh, I represent Cordy, which I was a part of co-founding in 2016. We're 50 people and we've built a digital assistant to listen in on doctor patient interviews and help triage the patient faster and more accurately. 
our basic premise was that we're looking at a future where we lack educated, qualified medical professionals more or less across the globe. And as we see patients becoming more and more self-educated, we, we increase, of course, the liability profile and the expectations of the patients. And we thought medical professionals could use better assistance as some of the tools provided historically has been uh, uh, recently pretty outdated. So our idea was building a voice-based service, a bit like you know from Siri, uh, that instead of just waiting for a command, is listening in when a patient is interviewed by a, a, a medical professional and help look at that interview and compare it to millions of prior interviews to see if there's any kind of pattern that can help the physician predict uh, what's going to happen with this patient and what does the risk assessment look like. Right now, we're implemented primarily on 911 and 112 calls. So that's when some of us have an emergency and we need dire help. Uh, we try to help the medical dispatcher come up with a conclusion really, really fast, since time, of course, is of the essence, uh, with uh, at least as few mistakes as they're already making. Many of them are very, very good. We just try to help them do it even faster and with an even higher accuracy so the people who might not have had a chance due to any kind of complication now will actually stand a chance of getting the treatment they need in time. Terrific. So I would like now uh, to ask each of the panelists to, to think back to your respective uh, Nordic backgrounds and what values uh, those backgrounds have brought to innovation for you in each of the problem spaces that you've been focused on. Uh, perhaps we could begin with Andreas and, uh, and hear about this uh, solution that he's been describing and, uh, and learn more about how, how this uh, might have fit. So I think um, first off, uh, coming from, from Denmark and Copenhagen uh, and having lived in the U.S. Uh, out of San Francisco, uh, I've seen the best of both worlds. And I think what we can offer from Scandinavia is at least a different view on uh, what support the patient can expect through their journey. We're all patients at some point. Um, and I think what we're trying to accomplish here is that with layered within any kind of, of interview, uh, a physician would deduct what is the most important thing to act on. And that, of course, stems from communication. And communication is global. It's, it's, uh, it's in increasingly complicated and uh, very much bound by the context of the interviewer. And I think that looking at that kind of, of complication coming from a small country with only 5 million people speaking a language many would find very weird just to listen to, uh, we have to, to build uh, basic skills within understanding language and actually compiling it. And we come from a country where we expect the best care possible at any given point in time. So the basic idea of, of taking that expertise that's anchored inside the context, inside the education, inside our society, and actually cherry picking that in language in real time and giving cues to, to what that might look like in the risk profile, I think builds a lot on the premise that coming from Copenhagen, we, we have a hard time finding that one patient across the globe might have actually the same symptoms as I have, but I have access to much better expertise. And, and that's exactly what we try to democratize. And I think that as a word is something that stems deeply with Scandinavian roots. I think that, that resonates deeply. And I'm curious, uh, Ole, if you could uh, to speak on, to the same thing, because it sounds as though uh, yeah. your background on ERAS has, has approached the same problem space. Right. Well, the, the whole idea came up um, uh, when I started working with a uh, colleague from Scotland a few years ago, and we got together with a, a few other colleagues from Northern Northern Europe, and um, we realized that, um, you know, people are, there's a huge variability in, in what is actually being done out there, and there's no uh, control over uh, the, the entire process. Everybody's doing their own little thing along the, the, the journey that the patient is making. Now, of course, Sweden is, uh, like many of these uh, Nordic countries, a very uh, equal country, you know, so we, we're, we're not uh, afraid of delegating and, and giving people the possibility to take control. Uh, and I think that um, we, uh, we then sort of uh, reached out to the, the sort of the core of uh, many of the people working in, in medicine uh, you know, we all go to work to to actually help other people uh, recover or, you know, with the, with the treatment. That's really why we're, we've chosen this job. So uh, by sort of uh, addressing that specific one and helping people to see what they're actually doing, 
but giving them the control. So this is all done at the floor where the people, the surgeons, the anesthetists, the nurses, they all get together and they do this control measurement and follow their data all together uh, all the time. They have the control over the entire uh, situation. And that actually uh, has been very stimulating for them because as soon as they know what is not functioning, they will start to address it. You don't even have to ask them. And once they start to get better uh, uh, compliance, the, the, it's been showing for everyone. And not least for the C-suite, you know, for the people in the management. So all of a sudden, here's a group of people on the floor actually delivering what the management have been trying for a very long time. So it's opened up a lot of communication between uh, the people that didn't speak that well before. And, and that has also helped to spread within the hospital. So, so I think that this, you know, this idea of not being afraid of, of giving it away and, and giving people, empower people and, and giving it to them. I think that that's, that's uh, from our heritage, I think quite a lot, and that's been good for us. And the interesting thing is it works everywhere. You don't have to be Nordic to do this. It works just as well in the Philippines or in the United States or in Latin America or in, even in Africa. So. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I'm, I'm curious, uh, Philip, to, to hear your take on this too. The, the approaches that you've been taking with uh, with Quality Life are, uh, you know, the, the regulatory hurdles that you have to overcome just as, uh, well, at least with relation to um, to a medical device. And uh, I'm, I'm wondering if there are specific elements uh, regarding the heritage that you would want to to emphasize uh, from what you've heard from the other panelists, but also other aspects that you, um, that you would like to highlight. Well, I share a lot of the, the things that have been said. Uh, I mean, our mission as we started was to, to democratize cardiology and really kind of help to, to target the, the leading cause of death in the world. And, and I think uh, the Swedish heritage has been strong because we're, we're good at innovation, we're good at being experts, but it's a small, small country. So we, we're dependent on international affairs. And, I think what we've done is using the Nordics as our learning and breeding ground. So that's where we train our algorithms. So that's where we learn from usability from the early adoptive Scandinavian community. And then as we bring this out in the world, we're now in Germany, the Netherlands, the US, and, and soon Japan. We, we're coming in with a, with a solution that is always targeted towards the individual, um, which in the end is always the end customer in healthcare. And, uh, so I think these things have really tried to change. And we we had a huge hurdle in, in the regulatory. We were one of the first companies in Europe having a medical device system consisting of so many different aspects in this digital space. And then we could use the data set from the Nordics as we went to the FDA and said, hey, now we've done thousands and thousands of patients. So FDA, you know, here's real world data. So so that was actually the, the tipping point of getting our US clearances. We didn't have to show US data because FDA trusted the, the demographics of the Nordics in coming in here. Uh, but I, uh, uh, I'm really proud to be a Nordic and I think that we're good at design and interaction and understanding the use and the affordability of, of all this, because in the end, um, we wanna make this very affordable and simple for the patient and making sure that providers are paid and that ultimately the payers get the, the most cost-effective solutions on the market. Yeah, can, so, can so I add one can... thing to that? Uh, just a quick one. Uh, just thinking that one of the things that I think is very typical for Nordic countries is we're we're pretty good team players. We've always been small. It's, it's for, you know, but it's we don't have a lot of individualists. We have some, but we have a lot of people that are actually very keen to work together and listen to others. And I think that that comes across for all of us. I think this is a great point, and I, I'm curious how then would you uh, make recommendations for others who are, who are listening to this, who are maybe in other places in the world? What would be the starting point? Would it be uh, the team player aspect? Would it be some of the elements of finding uh, those places where um, th there's more uh, you know, attitude toward innovation? What, what do you think is the, the mix that we might be able to translate to other people? Like what would be the recommendations that you would make to those listening? interested in innovation and i can my favorite comment is always you know it's all in the team the rest is just yeah. technology and innovation uh, 
you can't make it happen with like that. But and I think you gotta focus on you know don't get stuck on trying to small solve the small problems and rather you know what what is the the large scale scope you can do here? How can you you make a significant change and. Uh, that's why I always talk for the Nordics that we, sometimes we get stuck in the Nordics. Um, the world is very different outside of it. And, and uh, you need to be very adaptive to, to changing, to fit the, the needs in each country. I think. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think that, uh, uh, you know, although we, we, in every place that we've been training hospitals and we do the same thing everywhere, we're training people to actually work as a team where, you know, in many countries, the surgeon is the king, and and that's the guy who decides. Usually, a guy, also, by the way, uh, uh, and uh, to have these people to sit down and actually uh, train to listen to the nurses, what is working for them, what is not working, that has been, I, I think, an eye opener for many of them. But you still have to allow them to have their own culture in place. But just the mere fact that you can stimulate them by by doing that and and bringing in top name people and that we've been fortunate to have those on board to say the same thing that you know if some of the big professors from the US is coming to people in in, in other countries and saying hey we work as a team back home then other people start to listen as well I was lucky enough at some point to uh, to get some feedback from one of the greater uh, technology entrepreneurs of, of Scandinavia, a much smarter guy than I am. And he said one of the, the beautiful things for him being a part of the, the first dot com bubble back back in the day, 20 years ago, was that there was so many vast opportunities by just pushing things online. And I think, as he saw today, we're at a point where a lot of the really, really important innovations at this point might uh, not be as incremental as we'd like. So although it can be very favorable sometimes to look for the next thing to put in an app or put in a service or digitize, it's to do true innovation at this point. I think you need to rally people about uh, around the vision that's worthy. And I think it's not about getting further up the branches of the big tree. Since there's plenty of people doing incremental innovation, I think a lot of what's needed in healthcare right now is people taking a big leap of faith. And I think Scandinavia creates an ecosystem, especially in health, where you can go and ask some pretty hairy, audacious questions. You can both get the right people on board and you're actually there is room to ask them. Of course, we don't have the market capacity or market size to actually build companies, uh, a billion dollar companies, a hundred billion dollar companies. So we need to push them out the door of, of Scandinavia. But we have a very, very good sandbox to start building these and ask these questions. And I think that's definitely something we could, could could learn in other environments. How do you create these environments where you can ask questions and iterate on them and build the first early stages since that's definitely uh, get, getting through the threshold of just the early stages so hard and healthy, in my experience. Actually, stemming off of that, I'm curious if you have ideas of what is the next thing? Like, where would you want to be putting your focus now? Like, that needs the greatest innovations at the moment uh, from your perspective. Personally, I think access, we still very much need access. And I, for one, as a Democratic day and have a hard time not feeling that we all have uh, basic access, basic services. I think the, the, the beautiful times in, in history where all of a sudden when the first light bulb came on in, in the U.S., it, it didn't take many moments to, I imagine at least, to, to feel that this was a, a household innovation, right? I think we saw the same with cell phones. So like all of us, why would we have a smartphone? Why would I have my email on my phone? And all of a sudden, like you can't imagine not having it. I think health needs a lot of these moments, though. There's so many things we should have access to distributed, and there's so many things that are not even distributed equally. And I think I think the, the the biggest, most important thing we can do, I think that like, like Kuala Lab does as well, uh, we need to make sure everybody has access. And there's a lot of things, especially in my mind, the expertise to get the basic amenities, the basic advice, the basic expertise that in many places in the world is not even in place and will take many, many years, if not decades, to get it there if we don't use innovation and technology. And I think that's what keeps us up at night and that's what makes us able to to poach talent from much bigger companies and pay them much less is that we all really dream of a world where the amenities the light bulbs of the innovation in healthcare is turned on i mean i think Coleman, the we're, same we're, question you're right. we're uh <clears throat> my two dream areas is one is the whole digital therapeutic side and how you can use devices and, and, and systems to actually have a therapeutic benefit. And, and we've done some 
some large studies on you know cohorts of, of a thousand patients and proving that by, by using a device like ours you can actually improve quality of life and, and improve outcomes so so you can prescribe um, device and, and digital solutions as an alternative to to, to pharma and alternative to uh, to interventions um, so that's in one one of the futures the other one is we're working very much on, on the algorithm set and, and how to do predictive analytics in this. I mean, despite what's happening in the world every day um, right now, 25,000 people every day are right now are dying in cardiac related disease they did not know they had. So if you can help on a broad scale to early detect these problems and by that coming in and then helping to treat and, and avoiding this happen, there is an enormous opportunity out there to, to help save the world. Um, um, so uh, those are the two targets for my future. Yeah, I think what in medicine really uh, what is needed is uh, to be able to perform good clinical studies much faster, much better, and much cheaper. And I think by building a, a platform where people are recording their data on a daily basis for everything that is making a difference for the outcome, uh, with every patient that they put in, we have created a system that is actually uh, it's it's a quality registry for all those hundreds of countries that don't have it today, but it's also a fantastic platform for for research, and that's something that we're uh, heading into and we're developing right now. So you can just imagine doing randomized trials on data that's already uh, being collected with just the additional questions that goes with that specific trial, you would, and a huge number of uh, units that are on board where we have full control over exactly what's going on in each one of these units. We have a fantastic platform to do research at a much faster pace and much, much cheaper because it's, it's costing way too much and it's taking too much time. And on top of that, if we have a lot of users on board, then obviously we have a fantastic opportunity to bring the new treatments out to all of those much, much quicker. Uh, people are not aware, but it takes 15 to 20 years to actually get a new proven treatment to be a standard of care. So, I mean, here's a huge job ahead where we can use modern technologies, just like my fellow uh, panelists have been, have been stating here. This is really the future. But I think it's combining these ideas, uh, new devices, uh, artificial intelligence and a big platform where a lot of people are involved and doing it as part of their uh, regular care. That's what I'm hoping for. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I, so uh, following up on that, uh, of course, the, the, the elephant in the room is the fact that we're not in a room together. And I am curious about your take on such a platform and on the different tools that you've each worked on and developed. Uh, in relation to uh, approaches to, to COVID-19, to this pandemic, and, and to both to stopping the spread and ideally to getting to therapies and vaccines faster. I think, Ollie, this point that you were making is a really important one. I'm curious if, if you have put some thought into what would such a platform look like and, and how could that uh, make a global impact? Yeah, I think that uh, any complex disease management uh, you could put on a system like ours. We just uh, happen to be surgeons initially, but we're looking at working with oncologists and, and other uh, pulmonologists and diabetologists and so forth to have their uh, protocols and guidelines put in place. Now, I think for uh, COVID-19, you would probably have to build a platform where, uh, you know, we don't know yet. A lot of unknowns are there. So you would have to just have a way of collecting the data and then use smart systems to analyze that quickly to understand what's actually going on. And you can do a lot of things with data that's collected, obviously. You can, you don't have to do everything prospectively, but you can get a good idea of and do hypothesis generating studies if we had a, a platform just collecting data and then use the same platform to, to do the randomized trials much quicker and much better. So, so I, you know, that's definitely a possibility. Andreas, I'm, I'm curious what your take would be on, on using data in this way. 
Uh, so, so I run a machine learning company. So uh, data is the life bread of, of all we do. I think, first off, I think something that's very underestimated in this data discussion is the quality of data. So, of course, yeah, all, all, all data that is hard to access seems to, to, to people to be, to be valuable. Uh, it's, if, if you can create correlation, that's obviously interesting, but it's not necessarily very important. Whereas causality is much harder. And I think we should be very worried first off when people start talking about correlation and actually what we're looking for is causality. And I think uh, to Ollie's point, we need, I think we need prospective trials and we need them to do a, be a lot faster and we need a lot more of them. And I think especially as technologists, so I'm, I'm uh, not, not a doctor, so uh, I wouldn't dare to, to, uh, to, to venture into, to, to lecturing on the smarts of, 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 of the healthcare sector. But I do know one thing and that is at least when I talk to smart doctors, uh, they have a hard time trusting a guy like me if I can prove it. And I think that's one of the most important things of the healthcare sector is that they are not swayed or or easily uh, impressed by yet another technologist with a good solution. You should, of course, see data. And I think that's something we have to learn to operate within the, the realms of, of of the medical evidence building, since that's not what's coming out of Silicon Valley these days, right? That's much more about build fast and iterate fast and, and, and maybe break some stuff on the way. At least that's what some companies have been doing. And maybe that's not where I want my data as a patient. So I think we should be worried first off with COVID-19. Yes, it builds a huge push on digital solutions and we see it in telemedicine, I think, a lot. But this should not mean that we should start uh, selling away our, our digital rights or the data that actually can create true causality without having that dialogue about what that means. Absolutely. I, I think that this is a really important topic. I think, Philip, at the, at the top of this uh, panel, you had discussed the fact that your tool already could be used toward lung sounds uh, as a thing. But I'm, I'm wondering if you could address this point that Andreas is making yeah. relating to uh, some of the privacy issues that, that come about. Yeah. I mean, we <clears throat> my my initial thought when, when setting up the company was to to use all this data from from a very diverse usage group uh, and create uh, one of the largest databases ever on on uh, arrhythmias and and uh, heart sounds. So we ask every single patient that uses our system if they want to share their data in what we call the Koala Atlas. And uh, approximately eighty percent of of all our users opt in to share their data for research purposes. So we built a database today of, I think it's now way beyond thirty billion data points. Uh, of data, which ultimately we want to share with the world. I want to go to Ola and, and to other researchers and say, hey, what can we do with this now to crack the code? Um, so we just announced a, an interesting partnership with Microsoft and Novartis, where it's called a data collaborative. And really, how can we jointly help to, to minimize the data divide and, and make this valuable data available to everyone? So. So we, we spent too much money on lawyers and, and, and thoughts on how do we address this from a privacy point of view, but we simply did it by, by, by letting the, the patient or the user decide themselves how they want to do it. And I think it's very clear that people do want to share their data. And the, the, the data says the sicker you are, the, the higher the probability or the willingness you are to share your data with others to help make a difference. Um, yeah, so doctor, I can, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. No, I just wanted to quickly share that. So on the on the lung sounds, the, the, the beauty there. So we had our first patient started up last week in a rural setting um, in the middle of the U.S., uh, probably on, on, on COVID diagnose. Um, and then we could connect in physicians at, you know, leading hospitals um, uh, in larger cities in Ohio, et cetera, who could then remotely collaborate and, and review the data that are coming in in real time from this patient in their home. So I just see these, the new types of devices, solutions, software, platforms out there, such an enormous ability to connect the world and then really join forces to help save a lot of patients up there. Yeah, I just wanted to, just to add to that, as a doctor, it's, uh, I mean, it's it's paramount that you stick to the ethical rules. And, uh, and of course, uh, like Andreas was pointing out, it's, uh, you know, bad data is not going to help anybody. So you need to validate all the data that comes in. Uh, and, and that's something that we're surely doing. And on top of that, of course, every patient that goes into our data system has agreed to, to, to participate. Uh, we have, we have about 80,000 now, uh, different surgeries, uh, most of them, uh, major operations. And that's, uh, uh, really something that I think can grow very, very quickly. 
and then we can use it for those randomized prospective trials to find the causality that we're all looking for. But it's, a, it's also good to, to be able to focus using older data already collected to do the right study. So you can, do, you, can, you can play around with that data to see whether you're, you know, to find which are the hypotheses that might be most interesting to study prospectively. But I, I, I think, think guess, this uh, is all should be coming together. Yeah. I think a small note on that, I think that that is very interesting, is that uh, I would definitely trust you all with my data. But I think there is also a big build up on uh, the society and the school of ethics we all stem from. Right. So there is just got to be companies. And I think right now we have a geopolitical crisis between certain nations where some of those actors from those countries operate under a different code of ethics, given that their socioeconomic status and other problems keeps creating hassles that we for, for, for a long time ago has been, been, been able to, to, to tackle, which they maybe haven't until recently. And that has built a different kind of culture around data. I think one of the things we can build on in Denmark, and I think, one of the thing, I think, I think a lot of tech companies in the U.S. Uh, could look at, since we have a lot to learn from U.S. companies too, is at least how do you build a, uh, a precedence of a long time of very trust, trustworthy behavior. And I think that stems a lot from how can you be proactive into trust? So I think the Atlas is a great example of something you can do proactively. Maybe you can't do the most riveting things in the beginning, but when you start diving into it and you build a platform, you also commit to a way of thinking, uh, ethics, a moral around how you're going to look at your data, what you're going to teach your employees about data, and that's what's going to create operational excellence over time. And I think that truly will create trust. Yeah. I think this, this point about trust in particular in the system is, uh, cannot be overstated. And I'm, I'm so thankful for all of you for being here today, uh, to share your perspectives and, and particularly on, on these last aspects to talk about how your backgrounds have, have brought us to this point where we, we can build these innovative, uh, technologies that can impact, uh, the more global realm. So, I hope that the audience uh, joins me in, in thanking uh, Philip, Ollie, and Andreas for their perspectives. And, uh, and thank you to the organizers of this forum uh, for hosting us in this uh, virtual realm uh, today. Thank you so much. Thank you. What an amazing panel. We actually have uh, two of the panel participants still online. So Andreas and Ola are with us online. Um, we have a question here that I'm going to ask the same question of both of you. So as we pass this immediate first peak of the COVID-19 pandemic and, and as we manage onwards and out of it, what do you think are the biggest challenges healthcare systems are facing globally? And how can the health tech industry, particularly the Nordic one, help overcome them? Yeah, uh, Oli here. Um, I think that's a, a very burning question, obviously. We we see that for surgery around the world, uh, this has been stalled. A lot of cancer patients, other patients have been having to wait for their operations. And um, so we have a huge backlog of patients in need of care. And at the same time, an exhausted uh, organization with uh, uh, overloaded intensive care unit. So I think that if we could help people use technology to get control over their practice using systems like ours, uh, we could help people actually get through their operations uh, without uh, having to visit the intensive care and get out of the hospital feeling fine much quicker. I mean, we're talking 50% reductions in complications for many of those surgeries. So I think that's where we can help. And we really hope that we will be able to uh, to to play a role here because it's really going to be needed. Thanks, Ola. Andreas, I think what what I want to talk about is maybe a bit more high level. I think uh, what we will need to to ensure is going to be building trust. And as I see it, it's really exciting that not only is health, of course, as healthcare is facing a lot of problems, but it's also going to be the place where we find all the solutions to this new line of defense we need against this kind of pandemic, which will happen again, of course. And not only will vaccines and treatments and research come from here, but also new care paradigms of how we empower patients to be well-educated, get the treatment they need, and actually have access not only to expertise, but also to to treatment plans and surgery and so on. I think there's a lot of new paradigms that need to be developed. 
And I think a, a long-term Nordic approach like Martin Nimikos talked about could have a massive impact here. And I think some of the solutions that builds on empowering patients and ensuring everybody has equal access is some of the things we can help here at the Spearhead. Yeah, I, thank you, Andreas, and thank both of you for being part of this amazing panel. So, Robert, some words of wisdom to lead you off there. Well, it is, uh, I must admit, I'm a bit sad. Uh, the Nordic Innovation Summit 2020 is coming to a close. Um, with that, I would like to take the opportunity, please, all of you, visit us, NIS. 2020survey.com. Love to hear your feedback. That helps set us up for great success for next year for the Nordic Innovation Summit also. Uh, if I could, I, I'd like to share uh, a reflection and draw from, I'm working on a book called Sustainable Vikings and what the Nordics can teach us about sustainable capitalism and building resilient societies. And I'd like to share with you the first sentence from that book. And it is, I believe the Nordics can save the world. Now that's a pretty bold statement. I truly believe it. And I don't mean it as convenient praise, but rather more a call to duty, a call to responsibility. And the world is in such need for leadership. These days, it's more evident now than ever. And we need the Nordics to step up on the global stage and to assume their rightful role as leaders. Many of the conversations that we had today, I think serve as excellent evidence. Why, why the Nordics? Now, we're talking also about here with the Nordic Innovation Summit, we're building a community, fostering community. And of course, that's what the National Nordic Museum also does as the rightful home of the Nordic Innovation Summit. So please also go to the National Nordic Museum website and join me as a member and join today and please go uh, to do that because we are building a community and we're bringing more folks in who maybe previously hadn't had an interest or an awareness of the Nordics and we're drawing attention to that. So uh, with that, Berger, I'm going to pass it back to you, but I would like to say that I feel particularly hopeful because of the important work that's being done in the discussions that were had today. Berger, please. Thank you, Robert. So with that, I'd like to thank our sponsors again. If you could perhaps bring the slide back up so we can, can see them properly. They've helped a tremendous amount and they've stuck with us as we made this uh, difficult and duct taped transition from fully physical via hybrid to fully virtual. We believe that because of this year's experiences, we're the better for it. So we aspire to make next year's event a hybrid event. So uh, go ahead, mark uh, May 19th in your calendars already, because that's when we hope to see as many as possible of you at the museum. And those who cannot be there, uh, you be continued to be welcomed virtually. And uh, finally, I'd like to extend the thank to the whole team that has pulled this together because it's really taken a village. Um, if you could bring up the, the roller uh, texts, you can see them all here. Uh, the team at UW TV, fantastic help. The whole team at the museum, the team at Inventio, all our sponsors, heartfelt thanks from everybody here at the organizing committee. With that, thank you so much. Good afternoon if you're there and good night if you're over here.